Hello, and welcome to the first of Future Date Conference. Uh, my name is Matt May, and on behalf of all of the volunteers that could help to make this a reality, uh, we are excited to bring you a conference that nobody really had planned until about a month ago. Um, you know, I, I think all of us are dealing with uh, the COVID-19 uh, response and are in quarantines, and we had a lot of conferences that we had planned, uh, but they have all become canceled and uh, we wanted to find a way for people to still get the word out about the things that matter to them. Uh, and so we're, we're happy to bring this to you. We have a great lineup of speakers and we hope that we don't have to give another one of these again because we will all be able to, to go out and attend the conferences that, that we're used to. Uh, so I am excited for what we have in store for you. Um, first, I want to, uh, to talk about some sad news. Uh, it's the, since the last time that, that many of us got together at conferences like CSUN and South by Southwest, um, we've lost a few people in the accessibility community uh, that have meant a lot to us. And I want to recognize uh, Joe O'Connor, uh, who was the uh, CSUN webmaster uh, it was a fixture at the CSUN events year after year, um, and, and a, a great guy. Uh, and uh, also Jim Thatcher, uh, who is a legend in the field of accessibility, uh, who invented the first PC screen reader, uh, you know, has, has always been there for the, uh, for the community, uh, and who also passed last December. Uh, and more recently, another good friend of mine, Christopher Schmidt, uh, who, who passed away uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I wanted to sort of send my best wishes uh, to, to their families and uh, wanted to just remember them before we get this started. Uh, all of them had uh, strong connections to, to accessibility and to the kinds of events that we are trying to, uh, to emulate with this conference. So before we get started, I want to thank all of the volunteers that have helped to make this happen. Um, this was just kind of a weird little idea, uh, and we managed to get uh, so many people that have been able to help and shape it. Uh, we had a program committee, we had a tech committee, and so I wanted to thank I wanted to thank all of them, but some of them in particular for the the amount of work that they put into this. And so uh, first, I'd like to thank Lanya Butler. Uh, Lanya was. Uh, the the head of our tech committee they're also on our program committee uh, so uh, there's been a lot of work uh, behind it, behind this just getting all of the materials put together and captioned and so I want to thank Lanya uh, also Sophia Morgan who uh, headed up our program committee uh, we had several people that got together uh, got to pick from a large number of, uh, of submissions. And I think we have some really great presentations that, that are coming out of that. And so I want to thank Sophia for being organized uh, when I'm not at all that, uh, that type of person. Um, Seth Kane uh, has, has contributed a, a lot, including doing a lot of the, uh, of the work putting up the website, which is, uh, if you haven't looked at it, afuturedate.com. Uh, we have all of the, the, uh, the, the volunteers' uh, names and information, uh, as well as the, the program for, for the next few days uh, on the website. Uh, and also, we are going to use uh, afuturedate.com as the hashtag. So hashtag a future date if you're gonna be posting this on social media. Um, other people I wanted to shout out, uh, Anna Cook uh, developed our logo. Uh, and if you, are, if you like it, uh, we are going to be posting some merchandise on a future date.com slash, slash merch. So if you would like to uh, show that you have been to the first a future date conference, uh, we are going to to sell t-shirts and stickers on Teespring, and uh, we are going to give all of the proceeds away to COVID and disability related charities. So we will post more information about that after the the conference. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Michael Berger, Hiral Meda, Chris Worelli, 
uh, Sumner Davenport and Crystal Preston Watson for, uh, for, for being on the, the committees and really contributing a lot to, uh, to make this happen. So uh, that's, that's it uh, for, the, for the volunteers, but I also want to thank the, um, the, the people, the, the companies that have given us uh, some, uh, some support, uh, in particular 3Play Media. Uh, they have been gracious enough to provide the captioning for all of these sessions for free. And we thank them because we have done this with basically zero budget. Uh, I paid for a domain and that's really it. So I want to thank 3Play Media for, for that support and also to Basecamp for providing us with the, uh, the, the software that we're using to, to help organize the conference. A um, couple of rules. We have a, uh, a code of conduct. Uh, it's pretty basic. Uh, we, it is posted on the website at a future date.com. Uh, the basics are just be nice. Uh, we have uh, a number of moderators that will be in the chat, which should be over to your right over here. Uh, and they will uh, be monitoring and making sure that everyone behaves. Uh, but please, please be kind. Everybody is, is volunteering their, their time and resources to, uh, to, to make this happen. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first presentation and I am still just amazed that I get to that, that I get to do this but those of you who are familiar with the CSUN conference are familiar with the digital accessibility legal update uh, Lainey Feingold has been doing this for years it is the most popular conference always overfills the room always people that can't do it and all of you get to be in it now all of you get to attend the the, the, the legal update so uh, Lainey Feingold and Tim Elder will be our first keynote. We have a long day ahead of us. Uh, all of the speakers, or nearly all, will be in the Q&A on the, the chat uh, to the side here, and uh, we uh, can, can get started. So uh, please enjoy the conference, and, uh, and thank you. And here is the Digital Accessibility Legal Update. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first session of a future date. We are really uh, grateful for all the volunteer organizers who put this together and for uh, Three Play Media who's doing the captioning. This is a digital accessibility legal update that was originally slated for CSUN at 2020. And um, I'm Lainey Feingold. My Twitter is up here at LF Legal. I'm a disability rights lawyer. I've been in the accessibility space since 1995. Um, I have written a book about the importance of, <clears throat> excuse me, collaboration um, and accessibility. It's called Structured Negotiation, a Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. I do a lot of work with Disability In as an accessibility subject matter expert. And I do a lot of talks and trainings like this. So I'm very glad to be kicking off this conference and kicking it off with my co-presenter, Tim Elder. Hi, Lainey. Thanks so much. It's thrilling to be here with you, although virtual. I'm disappointed we couldn't be there in person with the CSUN convention, but I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to really uh, get this information out and do this legal update. It's also exciting to be here uh, with Lainey in particular. My name is Tim Elder. I, we are the TRE Legal Practice we're a law firm located in San Francisco. We primarily focus our practice on civil rights cases on behalf of disabled individuals. We tend to focus on technology access issues that benefit people with disabilities. We've done anything from mobile apps to websites to ride sharing we pursue structured negotiations in Laney's footsteps, and we also use litigation, all tools within our toolbox. Um, okay, so I just want a uh, slight reminder that this is the digital accessibility legal update. There's a lot happening in the legal space. It's literally impossible to cover everything in one hour. Um, I have a tab on my website, which is LF Legal. A high level nav is legal update. 
So you can go back and look at updates back. I think I have them back about six or seven years. So what you'll get today is a high level snapshot of what's happening. And if we don't talk about something you're interested in, you can always reach us afterwards. Again, we have our Twitter up here at TRE Legal and at LF Legal, and we'll give more contact information later. So we want to start with a dedication. Uh, we want to dedicate this session to three, uh, two people and one group of people. Uh, Jim Thatcher and Joseph O'Connor are two leaders in the digital accessibility space that have died in the past year. They were mm, such a part of my education around accessibility, beloved by this community, part of CSUN where this was originally presented. So I have pictures of Jim and Joseph up here. And if you don't know who they are, I really encourage you to read more because you'll get just a beautiful taste of what this community is about. And we also wanna dedicate this to the healthcare workers. I have a picture of people all in uh, personal protective equipment who are working tirelessly, many of whom are dying to save our lives in this environment, which has caused us to do this presentation virtually. So um, just feels like appropriate to bring them into this presentation that we're doing virtually. And I think Tim and I will also share along the way, mm, it just impacting accessibility a little bit to think about so much going virtually now. So I wanna hand it over to Tim to um, get us started with some of the rules. Okay, what presentation from lawyers would be complete without disclaimers and caveats? So just a couple quick ground rules. We will refer to people with disabilities in the, in the tradition of person first language, but we may also refer to people as uh, disability first. There's competing views. Some people believe the person should be emphasized first. Other people with disabilities see that there is some pride and ownership in putting the disability status first. Blind voters, for example. The, the main takeaway is it's the dis person with the disability or the disabled person's choice. And we really just seek to honor whatever preference people have. There's no rule it, other than to respect what people want to be referred to as. Also, this is not legal advice, so please don't take it as such. This is meant to be informative, overview in general. As always, check in with your lawyer who can apply the law to your specific facts. Lady. Okay, thank you, Tim. So why are we here? Why are we kicking off an accessibility, inclusive design, inclusion conference with a law question? Why is the law part of digital accessibility? And the answer is really quite simple. Accessibility is a civil right of disabled people. Accessibility is a human right. Depending on where you're listening from, some countries talk about human rights. In the United States, we tend more to talk about civil rights. For the purpose here, one in the same. And I have a slide here of a march that was part of the run-up to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is gonna celebrate its 30th anniversary in July. Uh, a lot of disabled people with a big banner across, taking up the street, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, Martin Luther King quote. So, um, you know, sometimes I think, oh, what's tweetable off a presentation? Or what is the one takeaway? Or apparently we only retain 20% of what we give over in these kinds of things. So if you only remember one thing, um, accessibility is a civil right. And that's why we are lawyers working in this space. Um, why do we say accessibility is a civil right? for three reasons, because accessibility is about participation, whatever your role, and I know this audience is comprised of people in very many roles working to make the digital world inclusive for people with disabilities. Whatever your role, you are involved with making sure that disabled people can participate, that they get the information they need, and that we have security and privacy. And I have this illustrated with a big close-up of the coronavirus under a microscope, which is kind of amazing under a microscope. Looks like gummy worms and little yellow, it really looks kind of like candy, which is sort of sad given what it is. Um, this period where all of 
our lives have gone digital work employment uh, work employment applications education social connection it's all digital and health information without accessible health information people with disabilities are risking their health and safety security and privacy when disabled people don't have independent access when they don't have independent access to information, there is a security and privacy risk because help is needed. And now that we're all in our own homes separated, sometimes that help that used to be there is not available. So if you're with an organization that cares about security and privacy, you have to care about accessibility because the lack of access breaks security and privacy. And as Tim often says, accessibility is civil right because everything now, is digital. Digital is integral to every single aspect of our lives. So that is why this is kicking off with a legal update talking about the civil rights of people with disabilities. They're more than just values. Civil rights are baked into the laws, not just of the United States, but all over the world. We have a picture here of an unbaked apple pie because those apples are representing the laws. And we're gonna now talk about what those laws are. And later we're gonna talk about how to bake those apples into a pie with strategies. So I'm gonna give it over to Tim to talk about how those big visions of civil rights and participation and inclusion translate into actual laws. So Tim, take it away. Thanks, Lainey. These are civil rights, they are human rights and they are baked into laws. Whatever your role, whatever your institution, you are probably covered by some law that impacts digital accessibility. Let's go over just a few of the main ones just to set a base understanding of what the legal requirements are and where you can find more information. Obviously, the most well-known law is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This covers employers that includes an obligation to provide reasonable accommodations, but it also includes an obligation to make sure your policies and your methods of administration don't inadvertently screen out employees with disabilities. That is uh, becoming in an increasing issue as IT policies are implemented and we, we are working in a virtual digital environment. So how the IT is handled can absolutely impact employees with disabilities. And the EEOC's regulations that implement the employment provisions specifically mention elect accessible electronic information technology as a form of reasonable accommodation. And certainly it could be in the policy realm too. Second, if you work within a state or local government, your programs and activities, including all of your technology programs and activities must be accessible. There is longstanding precedent and reference to accessible technology in the Department of Justice's ADA regulations. Many states have citations to digital accessibility standards. This is a common area where state and local governments are covered and, and their digital accessibility obligations are contained. The ADA also applies to private businesses or public accommodations. Again, references in the DOJ regulations to accessible electronic information technology and a lot of litigation and case law applying this in the context of digital accessibility and websites. This also applies to transportation providers. The Department of Transportation has regulations that uh, implement the portions of the ADA that apply to providers of transportation. The ADA also has an interference provision. So if you are a technology provider, and you're not necessarily covered by any of these other provisions, you may be liable and have some ADA obligations if your business process is interfering with these other covered entities obligation 
to provide accessible technology. So take a close look at the interference prong as well, because it is increasingly becoming a, a way to ensure ADA digital accessibility coverage um, as the, the, the line really blurs from technology platform through to the brick and mortar traditional covered businesses and um, employers. There are other federal bodies of law that you should be aware of and look into. Section 508 applies to any electronic information technology that is being used, procured, or maintained, developed by the federal government uh, executive agencies. 504, uh, Section 504 of the Re Rehabilitation Act applies to any recipients of federal financial assistance. So if you're a government contractor or your customers are government contractors, Section 503 sets forth some uh, requirements for federal contractors uh, with respect to employees with disabilities. The Help America Vote Act is a federal standard and law that applies to voting machines. It's worth mentioning here because it's a good model for where we think digital accessibility is going in the future. This was a law passed in 2000 after the election problems. It required initially that each kiosk have an independently and privately accessible voting machine. And then after another date, it required the polling places to have universally accessible kiosks as opposed to a quota for any anything that was purchased with federal dollars. So the key takeaways are privacy and independence. That's where we're, we're seeing digital accessibility going. And not the quota model, but the universal accessibility model, all the technology implemented that's new, that needs to be 100% uh, independently accessible. A couple, um, uh, a couple other things to note. Um, there are no regs yet that in the in the federal side that expressly make YCAG the legal standard for digital accessibility for websites. The DOJ has not passed a regulation, but that's not really needed because the regulations already Im are implicitly requiring um, access to digital technology. So nobody should be waiting around for those regulations given the trends, there are references to other accessibility standards in other bodies of federal law, um, but folks shouldn't be waiting around. Lainey? Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago when we were doing legal updates at various conferences, we had to spend a lot of time on, well, there are no regs and what does that mean? And should we wait for regs? But the courts have pretty much um, recognize that we don't need regs to have ADA as something that covers websites and mobile apps and other technology because WCAG's standard is how you make sure people aren't discriminated against. The WCAG standard is how you make sure that technology information is effectively communicated, which is a key ADA part. So you can bring your mantra back to the organization you work for. The regulations are dead, but the ADA is alive and well. And hopefully there's nobody out there listening who still has to contend internally with um, organizations saying, well, there are no regs, we don't know what to do. So yeah, in terms of legal foundation and what those apples unbaked in the pie are, there's a lot of other things, just really 10,000 foot overview. We have the Communication Video Accessibility Act. We have the Air Carriers Accessibility Act. We have the Affordable Care Act, Section 1557, which prevents discrimination in healthcare. Um, internationally, we have the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. There's international laws and regulations. Um, in the EU, in the UK, in different countries. And so if you have an organization that does business, not just in the United States, 
it's really important to remember, even though there's a lot of litigation in the US more than other places, we have the foundational laws that are very strong throughout the world. So um, that's sort of the high level federal and international, but honestly, where I think the law is going and probably the most important thing to focus on is the laws other than the ones we've talked about, um, because the federal courts have, and I, want to predict will probably continue, continue in some ways to disappoint given the appointment of judges in the current administration. So I'm going to give it back to Tim to talk about some of the more unique and probably what we're going to see more in the future. Tim. Sure. Thank you, Lainey. So I, I agree that judges matter, but I also will point out that the, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a bipartisan statute. Um, and plenty of conservative judges have given very favorable interpretations to these laws. And that's true for both the federal laws and the state laws. So whatever we might think about the trend for judges in the United States, this legal requirement is still going to be there. And this bipartisan statute is, is still going to be vigorously enforced. And that's particularly true in state uh, courts and where state laws are uh, becoming m more important in some ways than the federal minimum standard. Most businesses don't want to adopt a patchwork of requirements where they're uh, meeting one standard in California and a different standard in Texas. We, we really do have a international marketplace these days given the shift to online activity and the distribution of software. So you should be aware that there are states like California where the legal requirement for websites is very strong. Courts have very consistently applied these statutes to ensure that websites and other technology um, must be accessible. We've had a couple cases, the California Supreme Court in the Square case has made that very clear. We've got other decisions like the Thurston case applying to websites. So this is not something you should uh, avoid. Uh, this is something you should be very aware of. In addition, there are, are other state law contexts that are being applied in somewhat creative ways. So fraud and consumer protection unfair competition, negligence, tort liability. These are traditional state causes of action and statutory obligations that really deal with products and the, the fairness and, and false advertising, these sort of things that is increasingly going to lump in digital accessibility concerns. So be aware of, of that and play to the, the highest standard, not so much to the federal minimum. Um, yeah, thank you. So, so that is our high level overview of the laws, which are still the apples and the unbaked pie that are on the slide. Um, so how do we get from the laws, which um, I agree with Tim that the ADA is strong. It was a bipartisan effort. Um, it's not going anywhere regardless of who the judges are. So I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you correct me on that. Thank you. Um, but we still have to get the unbaked apples into the yummy looking apple pie with ice cream that's also on the screen. So how do we implement? And um, again, just high level, there's basically four ways that these laws get implemented. And the first and most important I want to remember is that every Every single day, disabled people are putting these laws in their pockets. When they call your organization and they say, I can't do this, I'm blocked when I try to do this, I can't independently access that. Those are implementation of civil rights laws, even though people aren't framing it in a legal issue. So um, if you could train your customer service people, anyone who answers the phone, anyone who deals with the public to think of the people and not just the law, that is really the first implementation way. We have structured negotiations, which is a collaborative process that's been used for 25 years to deal with uh, web accessibility 
mobile app, other technology. Government agencies have played an important role in the past, not so much recently, but um, there are still activities by the Department of Justice, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, Air Care, uh, federal aviation. Um, so federal agencies enforce, but the main way that um, is taking up a lot of the legal space right now are the lawsuits. So we want to talk about what's happening in the lawsuit um, space. And we want to talk about it in terms of the people. Mostly lawsuits are often referred to by the company being sued, but we want to really leave you with the message that accessibility is a civil right. So we're going to talk about the the people, not by name, but by category, because even if we're not touching on whoever uh, your organization is serving, you can think about how your organization is serving people and how those people are impacted if you don't design and develop your information technology to be inclusive. So the first group of people that we want to talk about are the people who eat this yummy looking pizza or people who eat, which is everybody, Tim. Yes, Lainey, um, blind people want their share of the pie and equal access to it as well. Hence this nice image of the gooey pizza. A lot of attention was paid this past year to the Domino's pizza case. In that case, a blind individual who wanted to order pizza through the Domino's website and mobile app was unable to do so and brought a lawsuit. The Domino's argued that it was unfair for them to be brought into court at, under these conditions because there were no regulations requiring them to meet any particular standards such as YCAG and so they had a telephone uh, line on their webs, you know, posted online, and there were other ways of doing things. The trial court bought that argument and dismissed the lawsuit. The blind pizza eater appealed to the federal appellate court, intermediate to the U.S. Supreme Court. The, that Ninth Circuit appeals court reversed the trial court and said, no, the ADA absolutely can cover technology and websites. This case should move forward. The case also, the, the court also commented a little bit on the telephone access and said that simply alleging that there's a telephone number or the presence of a telephone number alone doesn't enable the defendant to get the lawsuit dismissed there must be discovery about the effectiveness of that telephone access. And I think a lot of us are very skeptical about how telephone access can preserve the privacy and independence and really give equal access to the services on, in the technology website and mobile app um, consistent with legal obligations. So the case was sent back down to the trial court for a trial on on these issues. The oh, I'm sorry. The, they did. The Domino's did seek review in the U.S. Supreme Court. It, the Supreme Court denied that petition, which means that this Ninth Circuit appeals court decision applying the ADA to websites that is the law of the land, and in the at least in the Ninth Circuit, the West Coast region of the United States no other federal circuit court decisions really contradict this decision. So most other federal courts will likely find this Ninth Circuit decision persuasive and it will essentially become the trend throughout the federal appellate courts moving forward. So be aware that this, this is a strong precedent applying ADA to websites and mobile apps, even without any kind of regulations and really puts a, a death nail in any kind of an argument that the lack of regulations should excuse uh, digital independent and private access into digital technology. Um, on my website, 
lflegal.com. If you search dominoes, I've written two pieces about it. Uh, one, just the basics, and two, a response to some of the commenters. So if you're interested in diving more into that yummy pizza, you could go there. Okay, so besides eaters, we next want to talk about shoppers. Um, this is, again, we're talking about civil rights of people who buy things. In other words, all of us. Um, this is a picture of a self-check at Walmart, and there's a lawsuit about this because two blind people uh, couldn't use this because it wasn't independently usable, it wasn't accessible, and instead of, they need to ask for help, again, breaking the security, and when they asked for help, instead of getting help, they got someone who stole their money. So this case is moving forward. The judges have already said it can go forward. There was an effort to get it thrown out of court and that failed. So this is something we're watching closely. Um, it has bigger meaning in my mind than just, um, you know, maybe it was a rogue employee or whatever, because it, it's about accessibility is more than just websites and mobile apps where the law is put its most focus. I mean, you heard what Tim said, like only in the law would you be talking about could a telephone substitute for an accessible website. So the law is, you know, the cases are catching up and there are more and more cases on kiosk, on self-check. I have a link on my website that's here. It's a bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash kiosks 18. And I started in 2018 and I keep there all the legal activity around kiosks, uh, healthcare kiosks, government kiosks, restaurant kiosks, the thing, uh, the Walmart check, self-check kiosks. So it's really important whatever uh, your organization is doing around accessibility, make sure it's not just about websites, make sure it's not just about mobile apps, it has to be about kiosks, email, et cetera. Another thing that's happening in shopping, which I almost forgot, um, is that we're waiting to hear about the Winn-Dixie case. And you can go back in the legal update and read more about the Winn-Dixie, but it was a trial where a judge in Florida said that the Winn-Dixie website had to be accessible, including third-party content, including you know vendor parts of the website. It was appealed and it's been on appeal for three years. So I'm gonna give a shout out to Christina Lani who mentioned it in a webinar yesterday and I had forgotten about it. So shoppers, next. My favorite case, campers. Tim. Yes, blind people camp and they want to have equal access to make their online reservations. Uh, this case, just for full disclosure, is one of my cases here at TRE Legal Practice. And it is novel in some respects. In this particular case, the California Department of Parks put out a bid to procure an online reservation website. A technology website developer bid on the contract and was awarded it. There were very explicit requirements in the contract to provide an accessible website, including references to YCAG and particular technical standards. The website went live and it was grossly inaccessible not even close uh, in terms of complying with the technical standards. A, in this case, we're actually pursuing it on a government fraud theory, arguing that the, the contract, which by the way, was $66 million to build and maintain this online reservation website, which is why we have this graphic here of burning money, um, but $66 million, the accessibility wasn't put into it upon launch. Blind campers were excluded. Some investigation was done through public records and the contract and the bidding was disclosed that this was a very explicit re requirement of the contract. So the case, was initially um, filed. The defendant moved to dismiss the case and the trial court denied that and let the case move forward and gave us a very helpful ruling in a couple of respects. So it, it allowed the fraud 
claim to move forward. And the penalty for that can, can be pretty substantial, right? When you defraud the government, you have to disgorge what you've received and there's some penalty involved in that. So if the penalty is $66 million, obviously that is, is going to deter future fraud in, in this kind of a context. The case also is alleging interference directly against the website developer independent of the, the fraud claim. So the court released an opinion that says that that is a viable theory, legal theory that will move forward in the case and the interference of the developer in helping the California Department of Parks comply with their legal obligations to have an accessible website. The developer here, the allegations are sufficient to allege that they have interfered with the ADA rights of blind campers to have a website um, offered by the, the state of California. The case is in litigation now, it's going through discovery. We will see what happens going forward. Laney has a bit uh, bit.ly link here, um, bit.ly slash six, six uh, million, wait, mill web. Is that what you have there? Yeah, M-I-L. M-I-L, yeah, okay. Um, so that is the case, we'll see what happens. Yeah, talk about takeaways from this presentation, just burning money on a $66 million website and not making it accessible even when it's in the contract. It's, it's really one of the most, I think, creative um, and important cases in the space right now. So I'm following it closely and I update that link whenever something happens in the case. Um, okay, so next we have employees, applicants and retirees. We could do a whole presentation on this and I plan to write about it. I haven't yet. In this era of remote work, what could be more important than making sure remote tools, software tools, conferencing tools, telephones are usable by everyone, including people with disabilities? Already before the pandemic, there were cases brought by um, employees and applicants about applicant portals, health benefit information, online assessments, employee software, job training, interview software, um, when you're thinking about hiring people, when you're thinking about employees, you may have an HR department that's familiar with reasonable accommodation. Digital accessibility must be baked into all these systems. Otherwise, we are not going to have people with disabilities in our workforce. So um, there's cases and some settlements on these types of issues. Um, there was a recent case on employee software in the state of Massachusetts um, against Epic. The judge said that case could not go forward. Uh, it is Massachusetts only. What happens with these lawsuits is, you know, the state laws, like Tim said earlier, are important and give a source of rights to people, if a case loses in one state, you don't have to say, oh, we don't have to do that because the case lost, because you're an organization, you're operating in every state. So I wouldn't put too much stock in a case that a judge says, oh, this can't go forward, because I think we're gonna see more and more active legal activities, structured negotiation, litigation, um, there was an interview software case, the EEOC filed it, the government agency, because a company did not offer a good interview platform for a deaf person who needed captioning during the interview. So we're gonna see more and more of these cases as work continues to be online. And I urge you to stay up to date with them and make sure your own processes are accessible. Learners. Yes, students with disabilities, and this may be one of our most timely topics as most education, if not all education, formal education in the United States at the moment, maybe even around the world, is going virtual and the technology is becoming upfront in the educational experience. There have been a, uh, several key cases that have occurred over the, the last year. A couple of the big ones, 
the National Association of the Deaf sued Harvard and MIT about captioning. Those uh, reached settlements this year. There is uh, a consent decree that's a good model. For, so if you're wondering how can I possibly caption all of my online video content coming from all its various sources, um, the, the, the consent decree is, a, is an, an interesting approach to how to scale that across a very large institution. So anyone who's dealing with this issue might take a look at the, the roadmap that was set forth in the Harvard consent decree and the MIT settlement. It, it gives you some idea of how to, how to do this and scale it and, and put a, a roadmap in place. There was also a trial a jury trial this past year against the Los Angeles Community College District. The, the judge and the jury ruled in favor of the blind plaintiffs. The judge put an injunction in place that requires the Community College District to make a lot of sweeping modifications to their technology systems. The jury found that the college's use of technology and, and other inaccessible instructional materials had a negative impact and discriminated against the blind college students. An award of $40,000 was given to one of the students. The case is currently on appeal, but I suspect that the price tag of this case when you add up how they have to scramble to change their technology now, the jury verdict, the attorney's fees that have yet to be awarded, the cost of just making the technology accessible or make sure procurement was in, in play and that only accessible technology was being procured would have, that cost would be far lower than, than this case. So we'll see what happens on appeal, but the plaintiffs in this case are on track to prevail in a, in a pretty major way. There have been other settlements with a lot of different educational um, institutions. There are some good models. The, uh, uh, the Miami uh, University case, we'll, put, we'll post a link to the website at the end in our resources section that gives you a good collection of the, the most notable settlements from around the United States with both large universities as well as community college districts or campuses. Okay, um, also for the Harvard and um, National Association of the Deaf on my website, you can either search for Harvard or I have a bit link up here, NAD and Harvard, um, and you can see the settlement, and I agree with Tim, it's, it's a really great model. So I'm gonna give Tim and I a time check. We have about 15 minutes left, and we have a lot to cover, so we're gonna speed it up a little bit. Again, you can always reach us through our emails or through Twitter for follow-up. Um, okay, so another piece of the education, uh, the image here, the image in the first one was college students, the image here is younger students because accessibility is important starting day one. Um, there, the U.S. Department of Education has been an agency that investigates web accessibility claims. They changed their process. They decided they weren't going to investigate in the same way. The National Federation of the Blind, the NAACP, filed the lawsuit. The process had to be changed. And then as a result of that, there's been a reopening of more than 700 web accessibility cases. So this is an area where the current Department of Education has been paying attention. We don't know what's going to happen in the current year in you know the current situation, but that has been happening. So um, the higher ed has more development in terms of private settlements and private lawsuits, but the K-12 is critically important too. Okay, citizens, Tim. Yeah, we have seen activity happening in this category. Blind citizens have been suing and have been successful in some cases in dealing with voting issues. For example, in Maryland, 
members of the National Federation of the Blind brought suit against the voting administrators because the, the ballot marking tool used in a polling place would, be, would flag the vote that was cast as a disabled vote. So it wasn't private in the way that it needed to be because this special, this special ballot was being output. So you could basically tell which ballots were cast by disabled voters using the special marking tool, the accessible um, you know, ballot marking options versus uh, all of the other ballots. So that case will continue to move forward for again, uh, private vote. In addition, there have been some cases, uh, one in particular against a state legislature to ensure captioning for the state's video content of legislative proceedings, the National Association of the Deaf uh, brought suit against the Florida legislature to ensure that it would caption its legislative material. So again, disabled people want to engage with their governments and the technology that's necessary to do that must be accessible. Okay, movie lovers. Um, you know, we did a lot of work probably 10, 12 years ago on making sure movie theaters were accessible. Uh, both there was litigation around captioning, there was a lot of structure negotiation around audio description, but you know what? I have a big X over the movie theater picture here because people can't go to movies anymore. So there has been, even before the coronavirus, an emphasis on making sure streaming is accessible and the picture here says Netflix enabling audio description. If you are putting out video, it is crucially important to make sure that deaf people, blind people can access the content of your videos, access the tools needed to get to the videos. And I like this as a reminder that we can be working on accessibility and five years later, the environment has shifted and we still need to be accessible and the law takes a little while to catch up, but it will catch up because again, these are civil rights. So that's another area of paying attention to regardless of the content of the videos that you're streaming, they have to be accessible. Investors and savers, real quick, this is a picture on the left of Bank America's uh, first brochure for their accessible ATMs. It says, did you know that Bank of America's ATMs can talk? And it's in Braille. And this was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, last month, was the first web accessibility agreement in the United States. I have the bit.ly for it. It's bit.ly B of A at 20. And I encourage you to take a look at that. It was a result of a structured negotiation. Bank America has been a champion ever since. And it's just a reminder that this is not something new. WCAG is now 20, uh, 20 21 years. I'm forgetting right now. Um, yet we're still seeing the financial institutions that have not been leaders like Bank America getting sued for not being accessible. And a recent one, uh, there was a $2 million suit filed against an investment house. So if you're in an organization that thinks this is new, that doesn't yet have the resources, the accessibility community is very generous, as you can see from this conference, uh, reach out talk to the people who've been doing this for decades, actually decades, and let's make sure financial information, health information, information involving privacy where people need privacy is accessible. Um, patients. Yes, blind individuals in uh, North Carolina brought suit against a healthcare system to ensure that its paper notices were accessible to members of the plan. This is highlights that blind patients and electronic information in healthcare needs to be accessible or any information really in healthcare needs to be accessible. But it's also a good reminder that any interaction that's happening in paper needs to have some alternative accessible format options so if your institution is communicating with people in, in only in paper, uh, you need to be thinking about 
how you're going to provide accessible alternatives. That might be accessible email. It, it, it might be other, other access to electronic information. It might be braille, paper braille. So this is true in healthcare and other sort of government benefits, but this is really a, a, a concept that would be applicable to any institution that is, is communicating with users or customers through paper channels. And the other image up here is a picture of a prescription bottle with a label that's blank because when a blind person gets a prescription and the label is not in an accessible format, like a talking label or a braille label, it's as if the patient is getting a blank label. We've done a lot of work in structured negotiation. There's been a lot of great progress on this front and having talking labels. And again, like Tim said, all of these are just, maybe you're not in healthcare and you're listening to this, but think of what else, what other information you are providing, how are you providing it, and is it accessible to everyone you're providing it to? Because these are the people using your products and services, and those people include disabled people. Um, okay, what about the ethics of all this? Well, those of you who know me know I'm very... Um, interested in the ethics of the digital accessibility legal space. Things have changed. Um, there's a lot of lawsuits. There's consultants cropping up who don't necessarily know the best practices. Um, all we can really say today is beware of red flags and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can search ethics on lflegal.com. I've written a lot about this. The bathwater thing is really important. You may get a demand letter. You may get a lawsuit. You may not think it's valid. It may be from someone who files 30 lawsuits a week, which is a big red flag. But don't forget that the underlying issues are about the people using your products and services. And we want to make sure that the laws stay strong, the apples get baked, and we want to be conscious that not all lawsuits are not all lawsuits are unethical, and not all lawsuits are civil rights lawsuits. And one of the reasons I like doing this, and I I liked you know I really liked Tim's case on the on the California Park System is that litigation really matters. Lawsuits have been really important to baking digital accessibility into the legal system. And so you may get a bad lawsuit that you don't like. You may hear about lawsuits that seem to you, oh, why was that filed? But don't forget that real people are filing real lawsuits and that matters. Why do I care so much about ethics? Because I don't like the fear that is produced. This, this, Zoom isn't playing this theme from JAWS that I like, but um, don't let fear be the motivator for your accessibility initiative. Understand the civil rights aspects of the law, but don't let, don't let it be fear. So that's why I have a big X over the shark. Um, how can organizations stay ahead of the legal curve? The big picture is that you need to bake accessibility into your organization's culture. And I have a picture of yummy cookies here that were baked for a talk I did in New Zealand. They have a ton of ingredients, and that is to represent both that there's a lot of roles that make accessibility possible. And all of you listening to this are in different roles, and you all matter. And the other reason for so many ingredients is there's many things that uh, create the culture. So, uh, Tim, why don't you just throw out a few? I think we have like two minutes to talk about it, and then, yeah. Sure. Well, one of the most important ingredients in this cookie baking process, right, is making sure you take a look at what you're buying to put into it and checking the label of those ingredients. So procurement and making sure that the stuff you're buying or licensing or using as you deliver goods and services with the aid of other technology, just make sure that you're asking, like, is this a healthy ingredient? <laughs> Um, is this something I want to incorporate into my um, product or service for my customers or service um, consumers? Uh, it, it, making sure you've got indemnification that the company that's selling it is putting their uh, money where their mouth is in, in terms of a guarantee. 
There's inclusive design, making sure that people with disabilities are involved in your design process, in your testing process, in your training. That's, all, that's a very key ingredient, making sure that, that the, a, a real disability perspective is mixed in right from the beginning and is spread throughout all, all of the, the process. Lenny, do you, you have, you're familiar with others. What, what, yeah, I really like, you how add? You, I like how you baked all those ingredients. Um, a, <laughs> yes. a couple things on the procurement, I have a link up here bit.ly forward slash D I procure, capital D, capital I procure. Uh, this is a link to the Disability in Accessible Procurement Toolkit. It is a wealth of information that Disability Inn and its corporate partners, I help with it, um, have about how you really make sure that you don't end up like the state of California. Um, a couple other links I, I have in here on the culture piece. I have to boot my Zoom controls out of the way. Um, another bit.ly link, LF Legal State. Transparency is very important and let the community know what you are doing about accessibility. At this link, I gather accessibility statements from companies all over the United States and the globe that can, I know there's still some lawyers, maybe you're listening and say, oh, we don't wanna broadcast this because it might you know, hurt us. No, transparency, letting people with disabilities know who to call, if they have a problem, answering it in an appropriate way, incorporating suggestions really matters. Uh, one thing about the ingredients, the law is a piece of it. Tim and I wouldn't do the work we do, we wouldn't be here if law wasn't a piece. But I like to say the law is a salt because you cannot have a sweet cookie without salt. However, if you have too much salt, you don't have a good cookie. And for that, I invite you to take a look at um, an article I wrote that bit.ly forward slash 65%. And it's an article about a question I got asked after a session like this. And someone said, well, if the captioning we use, it's 65% accurate, do you think that complies with the law? And to me, that just shows all that's wrong with a very narrow compliance focus. Do you wanna read? a book that's only 65% of the words? Do you wanna to listen to something that's only 65%? No, but when you're only thinking about compliance, sometimes you're asking the wrong questions. So those are some of the ingredients. And in the one minute we have left, we want to give you a few resources for staying on top of things. Cause as you can see, uh, there's a lot of things to stay on top of. So Tim, you wanna just go through some of these? Um. Sure. So first of all, connecting with people with disabilities um, and, and understanding the community and the issues that they care about and things that maybe they don't care so much about that you might think they care about. The consumer organizations um, have conventions every year. The National Federation of the, the Blind, for example, is an organization of blind people for blind people. It has a virtual convention this year in July. You can go to nfb.org to learn more information. Because this convention is virtual, it's actually going to be a great opportunity for folks to uh, participate, even if you can't travel and stay in a hotel for a week to attend this really great and dynamic uh, event. You can participate remotely this year and check in and, and see what people with disabilities are actually talking about. Um, there's lots of other resources. Lainey, you have your uh, website here with the, uh, the collection of um, educational settlements. Uh, yeah, the Laura Carlson at University of Minnesota uh, keeps a great list. You can find it. There's a bit.ly short link at bit.ly forward slash higher ed law. Um, Want to Give a shout out to the upcoming Nobility Access U conference. Again, like Tim said, usually you have to go to Austin. This year it's virtual. It's Nobility with a K, for those of you who don't know, Nobility. Um, it's a really great conference. Uh, the Web Accessibility Initiative has an intro to web accessibility course running on edX right now that is free. It's open till the end of May. Really a great place to start and refresh wherever you are. 
Um, also up here, we have the ADA title3.com, which is Safarth Shaw's uh, Title III blog, which always has um, accurate information about web accessibility cases. We have Tim's website, trelegal.com. We have my website, lflegal.com. Um, I have a resource page on there with lots of other information. Accessibility Twitter, hashtag A11Y for the 11 letters between the A and Y and Twitter is a great place to get information. And you can always contact us. So on the final page here, we have the dolphin because we don't believe even being sharks, even though sometimes we do have to file lawsuits, as Tim explained. Um, I've been lucky not to, but lawsuits are important, but you still can be a dolphin when you file a lawsuit. Uh, LFlegal.com and my Twitter's at LFlegal. And the last word from Tim with his contact. Yep. Uh, Tim can be reached at trelegal.com. That's at trelegal on Twitter. And thank you so much for your interest in this and your commitment to digital accessibility. I know you'll take this and make some, some wonderful progress in, in your respective roles and institutions. Yes, thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference.
Hello, welcome to my presentation, Using the Black Art of Marketing to Sell Accessibility. Who am I? I'm Stuart Hay, I'm Managing Director of Intopia. I'm also one of its co-founders. Feel free at any point in time, you can reach out to me via Twitter at OhMyDeity, or email me at any time via Stuart at Intopia.digital, and that's Stuart spelled as S-T-E-W-A-R-T. I really hope you enjoy the presentation today. I'm looking forward to giving you a bit of my views around how we can better apply marketing to help with accessibility. So at, that, at this point, let's get into it. So you may be wondering who Intopia are. Intopia is a digital agency specializing in accessibility and inclusive design based out of Australia and New Zealand. We operate predominantly in this region, but we do support other organizations beyond it. And our focus is to try and help those organizations do the right thing and become as accessible as we can possibly help them be. Now, with this in mind, one of our challenges we've come across is how do we help them to create as an enjoyable and efficient digital experience for everyone, but also bring them on that journey in a very positive way. And so some of the things I'm going to be talking about here are the things we generally do on a day-to-day -day basis with all our customers and clients and the people we work with uh, to try and help them uh, do as well as they possibly can. So you might be wondering, what does marketing have to do with accessibility? As we all know, accessibility in most jurisdictions around the world is a legal requirement. So why do we need to do anything? If it's a legal requirement, people are just going to be 
doing it. Unfortunately, that's not actually happening and isn't actually always the case. As we've seen, there are plenty of legal cases out there. We have in Australia, we have the Sydney Olympic Games were sued in 2000. We've heard about the cases in the United States around Winn-Dixie and Domino's Pizza. But for some reason, sites still are inaccessible and we're still finding organizations lack awareness and understanding about what digital accessibility is and why it's actually important. So here's the thing, I've got an image on the slide here, which is a poor woman trying to drag a horse to water. And the woman for me is compliance and the horse is businesses. And this is how I see a lot of the situation happening at the moment. We have people through compliance, legal compliance, trying to drag organizations to the drinking well of water, which is accessibility and doing the right thing. The unfortunate situation here is that, first of all, most businesses usually don't know about the compliance requirement. And even if they know about the compliance requirement or are told about it afterwards, we're usually berating them about it. And it really puts them offside. And in putting them offside, we have a problem because we've immediately now created a new behavioral barrier between us and them, us being the accessibility advocates, them as being the people who are trying to build and deliver services and trying to help them do the right thing. Because it's really not their fault if they don't know about it. I, we can definitely argue this on many different ways, but at the end of the day, if you don't know about something in the first place, really doesn't go down very well when you start to blame someone for something they don't actually know. So with this in mind, we've got to start thinking about this from a slightly different angle. How do we actually help people do the right thing? So Daryl Carnegie said, there's only one way to get anybody to do anything, and that is by making the other person want to do it. Now, this is pretty interesting because that's our challenge. Our challenge is how do we make someone want to do something that they may not be initially inclined to do? Now, I wonder if there's something we can learn about or some science that's out there that can help us with this. And the reality there is, marketing and sales have been around for hundreds of years. Their whole purpose is about how to convince people to buy something or to embrace something that they normally would not have thought to buy or embrace. So what we have here is an opportunity to learn from these classic techniques of marketing to apply it in a positive way towards helping educate and build awareness, brand awareness that is, around accessibility and convince people to come to the table. And what I'm gonna go through here is a number of sort of basic techniques that we've learned over the years, and I've applied these in many different industries before, including accessibility, to try and help educate people, but also help influence people and motivate them to come to the table. And if we can get them to the table, we're halfway to winning that battle of making them want to do something that they may not have thought to do, but in this case, helping them do the right thing on behalf of all those people in the world who could benefit and will benefit from a much more accessible world. So the first technique I wanna talk about is omni-channel marketing. Now, one of the biggest challenges many organizations still come across today, or many people come across today, is that there's usually a single voice in an organization championing for accessibility. And unfortunately, it tends to be the lone wolf chirping away, trying to convince others in the organization to do accessibility. And the problem with that is that with any marketing approach, people do not tend to listen to the single channel. What they do listen to is a multi-channel. And this is why when there's a brand out there or, or any sort of um, retailer trying to notify people about something new, they will try to get that communication out through as many different channels as possible, which is the omni-channel marketing concept. So with this, what we are going to look at is what some of those channels are going to be and how can we leverage a single voice so it sounds like multiple voices. So the whole objective here is try and use multiple sources. 
could still be the same person behind all those sources, but the receiver does not always necessarily see or realize that it all it is all coming from the single source. So the best way of doing this, if you're a single person, and this is all free type objectives that you can get away with here, there's no money needed to do a lot of this stuff. What you can help do to try to leverage and increase your voice is a range of these sort of techniques. So, well, not techniques, but approaches. And so the approaches could be something as simple as putting out a newsletter. Now, a newsletter is not that difficult to do. With a newsletter, your objective could be to try and get like 10 out across a year, so roughly once a month. Content, yeah, that can sometimes be a little bit hard, but content's not too bad because what you can do is subscribe to a, a wide range of newsletters that are already out there. You've got newsletters from other consulting firms. You've got newsletters from associations. You've got amazing uh, Twitter feeds that are out there, LinkedIn uh, influencers are out there, all sharing amazing sources of content that you can take and just collate into a simple newsletter along with some localized information for what you want to try and get across into your organization and release that across the organization. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. It could be something as simple as a Word document that you share across the organization or a blog environment uh, if you're using something like Confluence or SharePoint or something along those lines. So that's just one method of trying to increase the number of sources of voice. So now you've gone from a single voice to potentially 10 voices. Each newsletter in their own right is a new instance of a voice. In addition to this, you can do things like brown bags. Uh, we're big fans of, of going into organizations, uh, helping with like a one hour session. Uh, where all we do is we talk about what's happening with accessibility uh, or something around accessibility that we can share with an organization. And I've done this when I've been in organizations. And what I would, used to do was invite external companies and organizations coming in to share their knowledge. Now, again, with a brown bag, you can set that up to be a monthly type endeavor. So roughly nine to 10 brown bags a year. Call it a seminar series if you want. And based on that seminar series, the technique that I would use is work by threes. So every third session, you might invite someone from outside the organization to come in and share their case study or talk about what they do. So that could be another digital consultancy around accessibility. It could be another organization that has accessibility work that they do that come in and talk about their lessons learned, their challenges, the things they're doing. Um, those sort of people are always willing to share their experiences. That can make up like a third of the content of your brown bag seminar series. The other third can be based on uh, case stories from within the organization itself. So it can be the single voice of accessibility, the champion. It could be uh, some of the developers or designers talking about their experiences, maybe sharing something around how they built something on an iOS app to make it accessible and so forth. So now that becomes like a third range of content for you. And the third one in my viewpoint is where, and I strongly encourage this, invite users in who happen to have disabilities to talk about their experiences, their real world experiences. And by getting them in, what you get is a, a, an additional benefit from that because you start to then interact with that community that you should be supporting and helping and looking after. And they're a very important community out there. But so now what we've got is we've added to that 10 newsletters roughly a year, 10 voices and instances. We've now added to that brown bags and we've got now nine to 10 of those brown bags. So we've now got 20 different voices happening. So in addition to then all of that, you start wanting to walk the floor. And walking the floor, that's where you wanna get out and interact with the teams that are out there. You wanna interact with the scrum teams that might be out there, the dev groups, the designers, the procurement team any and all of them, and you want to be talking to them. And in talking to them, you add your voice to all of that. Once you get beyond that, the next thing you can look at is like the corporate strategy, trying to get some of the actions and initiatives into the corporate strategy. Now, once you start to stack this all up, none of this really costs you any money, but what it does do, it gets you some massive brand recognition for accessibility across the organization and it is very cheap and becomes very effective. So my main tip 
here. My takeaway tip for this is make sure that people hear about accessibility from as many different sources as possible. You should not be the only voice. Do not be the lone voice. Maximize, replicate your voice in as many different ways so that it can never be isolated to a single voice. The more voices you've got, the more powerful you, uh, a chance you have of connecting and reaching people across your organization. Now, I find going hand in hand with the omnichannel marketing is the concept of the rule of seven. So for me, I usually pair the two together, but I've broken them out here separately for the purpose of educating and, and letting you know these different elements to it. But the rule of seven when combined with omni marketing for me is this concept of the three by seven rule where in order for someone to understand and hear about a brand or a concept and become aware of it, they need to have heard about it from three different sources and heard it repeated seven times across those three different sources. So I've already spoken about those three different sort of potential sources in the previous set of slides. But here, the other element to that is the repetition side of things. So I want to stress the fact that the repeatability is so important. It's, it's repeating yourself and repeating yourself and repeating yourself. But there's a reason for this. There's a bit of neurolinguistics behind all of this because the repetition needs to be something uh, that is positive and consistently put out there. And I'll give you the best example of this. The neurolinguistics works on this idea, and you've probably come across this, about these interactions, these multiple positive interactions that you go through. And there's this, there's this sort of theory that through seven positive interactions leads to a positive outcome. But you sort of need to do those seven positive uh, interactions. They have to build up over time. And it's a sort of an old school sales technique where they have this theory that sort of by that sixth or seventh positive interaction, you might get your customer or your client to make or, or make the sale or you're making the sale to them and, and they're buying. Now, you'll see the evil version of this. The evil version of this is the clickbait um, headline sort of article that's on the internet where they go, oh, we have this beautiful article here, give you some information, but in order to get the article, you have to give us your email address and then we'll send it to you. And you'll see then what ends up happening is you give them their email address, you get this clickbait article, it's usually really high and fluffy. But the next thing you know, you've got them starting to email you, going, oh, can we have a conversation? And we have another conversation. Come on, can we have a conversation? And what they're trying to do is they're trying to generate these seven interactions. But the problem I've got with that is that's seven negative interactions. The positive interactions is where you might willingly put information out into the world, demonstrating your experience, demonstrating your thoughts and ideas, demonstrating positive situations, and people receive that. And if they think that is important, that information, they will go looking for more, more information. Uh, if you provide uh, multiples of that information, they will start to value that if it is of value to them. And that eventually leads to this concept of sort of that positive um, demeanor towards what you're trying to do. So again, repetition is important, but you've got to combine the repetition with very positive value outcomes from that repetition. So what I was mentioning earlier around about newsletters and what I was mentioning around brown bags, those individual um, sort of solutions that you're putting out there need to create value. There's no use putting a newsletter out there if it's not providing value to the readers in the organization. Uh, there's no use having a brown bag if it's not going to provide value. There are times I actually tried to create value when I brought organizations into organizations I was working for, but they were from high profile organizations. So I might have someone from Google come in and present at my organization. And there's an intrinsic value to Google's brand that I can leverage and build off of to try and promote the message that I'm trying to get out there. So you don't just bring anyone in from Google because that devalues the value of the brand. What you're doing though is if you brought someone in who is an accessibility expert talking about what they're doing, that increases that value. And you repeat that through many different sessions time and time again. And it's that repetition that becomes extremely powerful. So my two takeaway tips from this point is repeat, 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 repeat. 
you do need to be repetitive. You do need to sound like, at times, a broken record. But you also need to make sure that the interactions are positive interactions, because it says positive interactions that lead to strong relationships with people. And that's what your objective is. You're trying to create a relationship connection. OK, my third point might sound like an easy one and a simple one, but that's what it is. It's make it easy. Uh, I'm a huge fan of trying to make life as easy as possible for people. Because to be honest, you do not want to be this person. So I have a picture up here of a White Walker from the Game of Thrones TV series. And the White Walkers are out there to hurt you. And it's like anything else. It's not necessarily a White Walker, but you don't want to be the compliance Nazi. You don't want to be the auditor in the worst way interpretation of that word. Because to be honest, who likes to be audited by the tax department? Nobody wants to be audited by the tax department. We're, there's a fear level to that. There's a scare element, a scary element to that. And it's all about trying to enforce people and, and sort of slap people around the, the, the ears in a sense of try to doing the right thing. But you're doing that through fear and fear does not tend to create a long and lasting strong relationship. It doesn't encourage people to do the right thing. You may have come across the old saying, you catch more flies with honey. And that's true. And for me, when you're in an organization, that is what your objective is. Your objective should be trying to make it as easy as possible for organizations to do the right thing. So for us in Entopia, as an example, we, we sort of pride ourselves on being very pragmatic about helping organizations do the right thing. We've got some organizations that have thousands of digital assets. And there's no use, uh, use us going into those organizations and saying, you have to make that all accessible today. Because it's not practical. It's not going to happen. It is completely uh, distorted from the reality of those organizations and the internal pressure points and challenges they've got. Now, I'm not going to judge them on their prioritizations, because again, that's not my job to judge them. And I am coming at this more from a consultant's perspective here. But to me, also, if you're the internal accessibility advocate in an organization, you are also an internal consultant. And here's the thing. If, though, you create an environment of trust, you create an environment of practical uh, and pragmatic advice and support, and you're easy and approachable to work with, not prickly, what ends up happening is, you start to create this scenario of people trusting to want to come and work with you because they don't fear you so much. They know that you're someone who's there to help them out when they need the help. You're not there to try to enforce things on them. Now, there's probably going to be an element of that where in the organization you need to do that, but there's still ways of how you can create the enforcement arm of your work without you necessarily needing to be the bad cop. You can do that by having a escalation point to the CIO of the organization, the CTO of the organization, uh, an escalation point to an executive group who need to sign off on things that do not meet policy, for example, which allows you as a single voice or the accessibility expert to take a different approach where you can say, yeah, I'm here to help you. These are our policies. We need to try and meet our policies, but let's work together on how we can get you as far along those policies as possible. And if we do need to, or you do believe that you can't reach those policies requirements, I won't necessarily say no to you, but you have to go through this other group to get approval. So again, you're still enforcing the, the, the policies and the processes for your organization but you're sort of able to play that line of being the good cop and not necessarily the bad cop in the situation. We found a lot of our uh, sort of relationships we've built over time with a lot of the organizations we've worked with has come from that perspective of people working with us and going, oh, guys, you are so, you're so passionate, but you also understand what our business uh, sort of challenges are and our business requirements and our limitations. Now, whether those limitations are correct, whether, as I said, whether those priorities are appropriate is really in a lot of occasions 
not something we should be judging them on. What we should always be trying to do is help them get as far along as possible. At the same time, the way we provide information, present information, should be done in a way that helps organizations know how to pragmatic, pragmatically start those early steps to get uh, down the path of becoming more accessible. I would rather see momentum in an organization where they are making substantive incremental steps in the right direction versus creating a scenario of a um, um, go or no go type scenario where they either have to do it all or do nothing. Because to be honest, the easiest approach for them is to do nothing. So if you give them a binary type response of you have to do everything or nothing, you're probably going to lose that 99% of the time. If you give them those incremental steps, what you're going to find is they'll find that easy. And once they get the first couple steps done, oh, that wasn't too hard. Then they move on to the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. And so what you end up doing is you're playing a long game, not playing that short game. And that's so important. So my three takeaway tips here um, are be approachable. So it's always important to not be prickly, not be the um, compliance person. You want to be the person that's there to help them. Do not judge them. It is not our role to be judgmental of other people. Nobody likes someone judging you for what you do or what you don't do. Again, by judging people, you build distrust with people or distrust to you, and it doesn't help the cause of what you're trying to achieve. So don't judge. What you want to be doing is being non-judgmental. You are meant to be a bipartisan, uh, sort of a, well, what's the right term, bipartisan expert or, or person. You're there to be neutral for all intents and purposes, obviously with a, a bent to doing the right thing. And lastly, be there to help. You're there to be helping them. You're not there to be slapping them around. So if you're being approachable, non-judgmental, and helpful, you're going to make other people's lives easy, and that's going to make your life easy to get them to do the right thing. Now, the first three points I find are actually relatively straightforward and easy and uh, for most people to sort of get their heads around and, and do something about an action. This fourth step is about the psychology of persuasion, and it's a little bit more trickier. Now, part of the mistakes I've seen people make is that they are so busy and focused on trying to represent this large, diverse uh, group of society, which is the disability community, that they forget that what they're trying to communicate to is an even larger, diverse uh, community of different thinking approaches and behaviors and personality types. And as part of this, what we have to remember is that we have to connect with that group. So what I'm going to talk about here is a few different ways of how we can do this. Now on my screen is I've got a slide. I've got a sl slide, an old black and white slide of 12 white guys. 12 white guys around the table, a few of them with their hands up. Now this is a slide from a very old movie called 12 Angry Men. And 12 Angry Men was a short movie. It went for, I think, about 90 minutes. And one of the amazing things about this movie was it was a classic um, sort of provider of the art of persuasion. And the fundamental basis of this is it's 12 jurors um, sitting on a court case uh, for a unfortunate uh, black man who is being trialed for murder. And in this jury room, they're debating on how they're going to vote and 11 of them are voting guilty and one guy isn't. And the whole movie is about how that one juror systematically goes about convincing all other 11 jurors to his view that the poor man was not guilty. Now, this is a movie set in a certain time and frame and for moral political correctness, let's step aside from that and get to the underlying message here of what it's trying to portray. What it's trying to portray here is that in this particular regard, another one person needed to convince 11 other people and had to use 11 different ways to convince them. So he did everything from um, trying to blackmail them, threaten them, cajole them, 
uh, reason with them. All of that is what he tried to do. And he systematically did that for 11 different people. And eventually, by the end of the movie, brought them all online. Now, here is really a sample set of what we're dealing with in life. In life, we're dealing with 11 different jurors all the time, 11 different personality types, and they all have different reasons for what they believe in. They have all their own biases. They also have all their own motivators. And these are the people in life that we are trying to connect with and to trying to convince to our way of thinking. So how do we do that? So we do this by working on a number of different ways to connect with people because one way is not good enough. And to date, what I've found from when I entered this industry sector, which is the digital accessibility and disability industry sector, is that we seem to want to default to the compliance argument all the time, which is basically threatening people to do the right thing. And from my perspective, Threatening people to do the right thing is not a very strong argument, particularly when it's not enforceable or not heavily enforceable or doesn't easily get enforced. It, it does happen. We do have the case examples like Domino's and, and Winn-Dixie, and there's a number of them out there. But it's not enough to convince the majority of people to do the right thing. So what we have to now do is we need to learn a suite of different techniques to try and motivate as many different people as possible because you don't know what is going to be the motivation for a particular individual. And so you've got to match up a motivation technique to each different individual that's out there. Now, what do I mean by that? So for some people out there, they're going to be facts and numbers people. To me, sometimes I think of, of them as the Vulcans from Star Trek. Uh, very logical, very rational, and they need logical and rational arguments. They are not generally swayed by this is the right thing to do argument because that is not what sways them. What they are swayed by are facts and numbers. They want to hear things like the buying power, the, the actual spending power of people with disability will sway them. They want to hear things like People with disabilities spend more per transaction than people without disabilities. They want to hear about uh, people with disabilities are sticky customers uh, and stay longer with brands. These are all known facts that are out there. So these are the type of information we want to use to sway someone who's a facts and numbers person. And so you have to have that at your ready. But on the flip side, facts and numbers do not affect other people in the community. So what I'd call more the empaths of the, com the community, the, the sort of nurse style, doctor style, maybe not sometimes always the doctor, but the nurse style uh, um, sort of behavioral people in our community, um, they are heart on the sleeve type people. And for them, facts and numbers do not connect with them. They, they don't rationalize in that way. They rationalize in an emotional way. And so you need to make an emotional connection with them. And there are many different ways of making an emotional connection. Sometimes that's where you're sort of talking about the, the, the person who can't transact and thus they can't buy um, their daily household um, uh, consumption articles online because you haven't designed something correctly. So with those people, that is what you're trying to do. You're trying to connect with them on the emotional level. I also find with the emotional side of things, that is where having those empathy sessions where you bring real world people into an organization to talk about their real experiences and encounter them firsthand and see them as real people becomes really powerful for the impasse of our social uh, group that we're trying to convince. So that is um, one of those different techniques that we can use to try and connect and motivate that part of the community. There is another part out there. They are the reputational risk people. So they're the ones that are so defensive about their personal brand or their organizational brand. And yeah, we know that there is a, there's a risk out there that if you were to be seen to do the wrong thing, we've all come across these people. I, 
I find them quite um, difficult to sort of deal with at times because they have that veneer of, of empathy, but the reality is they're not actually truly empathetic. What they are is is they are more the rationalists. They're the in a different way, but they're they're more about that reputational risk to themselves and to an organization. And until they they believe that their reputation is going to be put at risk, and and see how that reputation is going to be put at risk, they tend not to value situations in the same way that you and I might value. Uh, or though, then again, you might be one of those people that are like that. That's not saying they're bad people in any way. It's just that is what is their motivator. So with those sort of people, that's where you want to focus on talking about the brand risk to the organization, the personal risk that, hey, if you've signed off on this or you've allowed this to happen, this may look bad on you as an individual if it gets out there. So that's another way of how we can sort of motivate that particular group of people. The other one I love is the geek out factor. Um, for me, our major crowd that we're trying to convince is usually the people at the cold face of digital technology. So that's your designers, your developers, your testers, um, and also sometimes your business analysts and, and so forth. For me, that group of people, there is parts of that group who really have that geek out factor to them. So new technology, the coolness factor of technology, the coolness factor of new techniques, all this sort of stuff. I love connecting with that group. Sometimes they annoy the hell out of me because they're also that same group that goes, oh, let's try something new for the sake of doing something new uh, without fully thinking through what that impact of that change is going to be on those people around them. But for me, that is also the group that gets really uh, sort of geeked out on seeing things like someone interacting with technology using a screen reader or a using that technology like a mobile phone without the, the screen on and fully interacting with technology. Uh, someone who's using um, uh, head uh, sticks and so forth, like all that really amazing technology adaption we've got in the world to help people with disabilities to interact with the world around them is a coolness factor for a part of the of society out there. So let's play that up in a positive way, that coolness factor that's there around that technology, because that will resonate with some people out there. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect with them and resonate. You've probably come across that situation where someone has seen a screen reader for the first time. And for the next couple of weeks, they're talking about how, oh, I saw this person with a screen reader. It was going so fast that I couldn't understand what it was trying to say but the person was interacting with it, understood it, they could hear it clearly, they, they were able to operate so quickly. Again, it's that coolness factor. So working towards that is a really important thing to aim for. Another way we can focus on connecting with people's personal benefit, I'll be honest, I've come across people who they're interested in things where they are made to look good. So this is subtly similar, but different to the reputational risk. These are the people that you sort of go, hey, if, if you support this sort of uh, process or support this project and you can be the name sponsor on the project or you can be part of this project, it's going to be successful and you're going to look good at the end of this. So again, if it helps someone, uh, if you can connect with them in that sense, that's eh, maybe a little bit on the greed side, but at the end of the day, that's their motivator. So understand the motivator and work on ways to connect with that. Now, my last point is bribery. Oh, sorry, no, I don't actually mean bribery in the financial sense, but there is the bribery from the perspective of behavioral inducements. Now, I've got a bunch of colleagues who love to bake food, and when they are working with project teams, they love to take in baked goods as almost reward inducements for when they've, good, when they've done good things. So I've seen people do cupcakes, and they put Braille on the cupcakes, and brought that into the office as a reward, but also sort of demonstrating to people uh, so that accessibility requirement to it. I've I've had people bring in cakes and brownies and, and cookies. And at the end of the day, from my perspective is, as long as it's above board and legal, if you can do anything to reward people for doing good behavior, 
then that is something you should try to do because it leads to positive encouragement for uh, more behavior, particularly the behavior we're looking for. So a couple of years ago, I was given this presentation at CSUN. I have to admit, we bribe people with Tim Tams. Uh, for those people who don't know what a Tim Tam is, a Tim Tam is a chocolate sort of biscuit cookie here in Australia. And for those people not in Australia, it's usually the equivalent of crack cocaine. It is a very sweet, chocolatey uh, sort of biscuit, which people seem to really love. Um, I took that with me to CSUN uh, to sort of share in that way. I've also heard of other people doing the same thing out of Europe with things like stroop waffles. Um, so whatever it is, look for a way to, for that positive encouragement for people. So my tips here are everyone does not have the same motivators and you need to recognize that. You also need to tailor your approach to your audience. There's no use using a motivator technique that applies to someone who is not motivated by that technique. So you need to work that out. You need to find out what is the motivator for the right person and connect that. And sometimes if you're not sure what that is, I generally recommend do a full sweep of everything. So your best motivators is doing a bit of everything until you work out what is going to connect with people. So that is my four different sort of techniques I want to share with you about marketing and how you can use that to help convince people to do the right thing. Now, I've applied these techniques over the years in different industry sectors, uh, across different technology bases, and I've found them, uh, I've found that they work fairly consistently and they're not that difficult if you apply them in a simple way. Uh, usually it helps you can, to get some of that mo motivation going. And I've seen other people have been doing the exact same techniques and also being successful. I've also heard people complain to say, oh, I can never do this, or I need funding or money to do something. Well, the reality is, is that you've got to build up that goodwill and trust with people before that leads to sometimes those financial supports to really take things further. But again, it's all about building that momentum in the right direction. I'd love to connect with you outside of this presentation. If you want to know more or talk to me about things that have worked for you or share ideas or learn more about some of the things we've done, feel free to reach out to me again, my Twitter uh, email or my Twitter uh, profile is oh my deity. You can email me at Stuart, which is S T E W A R T at intopia.digital. And you can find these slides uh, online at bit.ly, so B I T dot L Y forward slash black art a future date. Thank you very much for your time.
I'm Sarah Chavesi and I'm Chief Programs Officer at Fearless Futures. For those of you that don't already know about us, at Fearless Futures, we engage people in critical thought to uncover the root causes of inequities and grow powerful new leadership and design for transformative change. We do this through our London and New York offices around the world, from technology companies to investment banks to government departments and consumer goods companies. 
We work with leaders and managers. And our training is all about leaning into the depth and challenge of engaging with the lived realities of inequities and the ways that these inequities intersect. And that's the topic we're going to be talking about with you today. In this session, which is Thinking Outside the Boxes, a close-up look into incremental intersectionality. And I'm going to pass you now over to my colleague, Sable. Hello, everyone. I am Sable Lomax, and I work across the pond from Sara in New York City as Director of Programs. So I, Sara handles all of our programs globally. I focus on our, program, on our programs here in the state. So with that, we're now going to segue into what does this all mean when we, when we say incremental intersectionality, because I'm sure if you're listening, you're like, okay, Sara and Sable, big words, I need more context. Don't you worry, that's why we are here. I want to talk us through a few examples of celebrities just to highlight the intersections that we've been speaking of. But Sara is going to talk about intersectionality more concretely in a few. I'm just going to kind of highlight using some pictures what we mean when we say, are we truly looking at all facets, facets of someone's identity or are we still thinking inside the box? We want us to be thinking outside the box. So right for you on our screen here, we have Stevie Wonder and Kanye West. So oftentimes, not all times, but oftentimes in spaces when we're talking about disabledism or ableism, the conversation is rooted in those with very physical disabilities. Individuals like Stevie Wonder, where you can look at them and see that they have a disability. A lot of the times, those conversations miss individuals like Kanye West, who have an invisible disability. Kanye West, if you're not familiar, has shared with the public on various mediums in the past that, and recently in the past, I should say, that he has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So when we're having these conversations about those with disabilities, who is in this box that we are checking and who is being missed in that conversation? But just to push our thinking even further, when we are having these conversations, are we only talking about that particular struggle or are we highlighting that with even within the disabled community, there are various experiences that someone might have, various lived reality, realities based on their identity. So we have with Stevie Wonder, he has a disability. He's also a black man. Like Kanye West, he has an invisible disability. He too is a black man. So even though both of these individuals ha are black men and both of these individuals have disabilities, just the very nature of one being very visible and one not being visible, they have different experiences, although there is some similarities within the same community. So now we have two women in front of us. We have Nadia and we have Hillary. Oftentimes when we're having conversation that is connected or related to gender, we're talking about women. We're saying we need to have equality for women. Yes, that might be true, but in that it does not take into account the different parts of someone's identity that cannot be stripped out and isolated like this were a chemical experiment, if you will. So both of these women identify as women. However, the experience of Nadia Hussein is going to be very different than the experience of Hillary Clinton, especially depending on geographical context. And even within that, the experience is still going to be the same. It's going to be different. What does that mean? That means that when we go to solutionize, for Nadia, when we go to solutionize for Hillary, we have to take into account that their experiences are going to be different even though they both identify as women. We have Malala and we have Hassan Minhaj. So Minhaj, yes, we might look at their last names and say, okay, I feel safe to assume that they're from Muslim majority countries. So if we just take that piece of information or we just look at their phenotype, their physical characteristics, attributes, we might say, okay, they're going to have this experience being from a Muslim majority country. You might not even know if they're Muslim or not, but from a Muslim majority country. That might be true. 
However, the mere fact that Malala is a woman and Hassan is a man, they're going to have different experiences because they're dealing with different struggles. Hassan might have this struggle of Islamophobia, whereas Malala might potentially be dealing with, well not might, is going to deal with Islamophobia and sexism. And depending upon the financial status of their family growing up, they might be dealing with classism as well. And considering the accident and the physical experience that Malala went through, it is plausible that she might be dealing with some disabilities as a result of that experience that we might not see. Just because someone physically looks like, looks like everything is neurologically okay, etc., does not mean that that is the case. So here we have Ellen DeGeneres and Laverne Cox. So there has been, particularly in the United States, there has been wide conversations for years, but they've been amplified very greatly in the last few years, I would say, or re-amplified um, greatly. This, the, the issues and struggles for those within the LGBTQIA plus community. Yes. Okay, however, within that, there are different experiences. Ellen has identified as a gay woman. Ellen is still a white woman. Laverne is a trans black woman. That is going to be two very different experiences even within that community. Does that mean although someone's struggles might be similar, if they, might, if they are dealing with additional struggles, we have to rectify this reality that they will be dealing with a different experience. So we have three women on our screen, Beyonce, Sandra, and Barbara. So do these three women deal with sexism? Yes. But what Beyonce is dealing with is sexism and racism. Sandra is dealing with sexism and racism. Barbara is dealing with sexism and anti-Semitism. That means that although they're all dealing with sexism, because they're dealing with other issues, other struggles, it creates a different experience. Here we have Eminem, Jay-Z, and Serena Williams. You might be saying, okay, Sable, I've been flowing with you, but you threw up Serena on the screen with Eminem and Jay-Z, and now I'm confused. I will unconfuse you, I promise. Well, I will do my best, I should say. So if you don't know a lot about their upbringings, this will not turn into historical biography, but just to let you know, Eminem grew up in a working class background in Detroit. Jay-Z grew up in a working class, back, a low income working class background in Brooklyn, New York, and Serena, very similar, just in California, Los Angeles, Cal Los Angeles California. So we have three folks here who have, or who come from, I should say, working class families. So very similar backgrounds growing up as far as socioeconomic status. However, what are the differences here? Though Eminem may have come from a white, a working class background, Eminem is a white man. He's going to experience life very differently than Jay-Z, who is a black man. And Serena is going to experience life even dif different as well than these two, because although she was working class, and she is black, she's also a woman. So that's just the highlight. When someone has a similar struggle, when you layer another struggle on top of that, it lends itself to a different reality, a different lived experience. Intersectionality is a term coined by the legal scholar in the United States, Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 1980s and I urge you if you haven't already please 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 at this moment pause this video go to Google type in Kimberly Crenshaw and read everything she has written videos she's recorded because I couldn't possibly articulate her thought as well as she does and the examples she uses in terms of legal cases are really compelling and really easy to understand the concept. The concept of intersectionality, if we condense it and really simplify it, at its core is the notion that people can live at the intersections of multiple oppressions, multiple inequities, multiple struggles, if we want to call them that. That a single person can live at the intersection of racism and sexism, for example, as Sable spoke about earlier. And therefore, because they live at the intersection where those struggles come together, 
The experience of inequity for them is therefore compounded. There's that additional level, that additional layer. There is more to it, there's a complexity to it. But also, that it has specific particularities to it because it is these two specific struggles coming together or three or four struggles coming together. For example, if we go back to one of the examples that Sable shared, so we look at the example of, for instance, Beyonce. As a black woman, her experience of the world and her experience of oppression and inequity will have commonalities with that of, for instance, a white woman, it will have commonalities with that of, for instance, a black man, but will be different to both of those struggles because it will be particularistic to her living at the intersection of being a woman and being a black person. There will be particularities to it, expectations, norms, tropes around that specific identity. That at its core is what intersectionality is. Intersectionality is an enhancer, it's an elevator of our solutions because it allows us to lean into the nuance and complexity of people's lived realities of inequality. It allows us to lean into the entirety of some people's experiences rather than siloing it off, as Sable said, into those boxes. So I'm just highlighting a slide here that shows a visual of what Sara just mentioned. Some of us are very visual. I love a picture. Ta-da! We thought of you ahead of time. So this is just a visual representation of what Sara just described. And we could even go to that top axis and put disabledism. We can go to the left and put classism. We could add Islamophobia or um, what am I missing here? Colonialism, like we can add other things here, like she said, and it would create a very unique experience. Oh, and over, okay. So what does this look like? So we have a graph here. We take no credit for this, just for the record. Um, but as you can see, if you look at this image, it discusses median pay for women by disability status over time. So when we think in traditional conversations surrounding gender pay disparities, it is widely known that men tend to make more than women. And then that varies with various, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Within various industries, the disparity varies, but the reality is for just about every industry, there is a disparity between the amount that women make and the amount that men make. And even within the amount that women make, there's still differences there, which speaks very directly to what Sara was saying. The amount of money that a white woman makes per dollar or per pound is different than the amount of money that a Muslim woman makes, the amount of money that a Hispanic or Latinx woman makes, the amount of money that an Asian woman makes, the amount of money that a Black woman makes. So even within the gender disparity conversations, there's disparity amongst the women. So that's something we want to highlight. So knowing this, we're like, okay, but what about our disabled members of society? How does that play out? So it would be kind of, what's, what am I, the word I'm looking for? It would be a blanket solution to say, well, we want disabled members to make an equal amount of money as those who are non-disabled. If you just say that very quickly, it sounds great. But what that doesn't pay attention to is that a disabled man makes more than a disabled woman. So even, and it speaks to what Sarah has already said, even within those who are experiencing the same struggle, the same system of oppression, when there is an intersection in their identity, it creates a very unique experience. So here we have this graph that shows us the median pay for women by disability over time. Just want to pause for a second so you can kind of look through, starting off in your x-axis from 1997, 
If you read all the way across, the data stops at 2014. And then you have those who are non-disabled, activity limiting only is that yellowy line. The lighter yellow line, work limiting only, and then the kind of orange, burnt orange line, activity and work limiting. So even within disabled women, there are pay differences based on their ability. So here we have the graph for pay for disabled men. If you just look at it very quickly without analyzing it, we can see that, okay, they are making more. But even within that, there are still pay differences with, based on their physical ability, whether it's activity limiting, work limiting, or both. We can also see that their brown line is further below on the graph. They're making the less. So if you are both activity and work limiting, you're making less. And we can see how much those who are non-disabled are making. But if you look at this graph, why won't it click? Versus this graph, you might notice some differences. This pops out about here. That's higher. When we go to solutionize, we have to step back and take a look at what is all happening for someone? What are all the struggles that they are dealing with? Because when we focus on one thing, we create a simple solution that's not complex enough to deal with their actual lived reality. So now I'm going to pass you back over to Sara to say, okay, you've given us some graphs, but how does this actually work in real time? Now, the tricky thing with intersectionality and applying this in our organizations and applying this to our solutions is that there aren't a huge amount of good examples of how mm -hmm. this is done, which makes it difficult there because I can't throw up for you all these amazing ways that other companies and you know society in general have solved in an intersectional way. But there is hope. There are some things we can start to think about. And these are small things that I've thought about sharing with you here that are quite easy to do, you could do tomorrow when you're trying to tackle the inequity that is faced by disabled people in an intersectional way. One, something really easy, is to stratify your data. If you're looking at data within your organization, you're looking at data across society, at outcomes, specific outcomes for disabled people, exactly as Sables just spoke about, in comparison to non-disabled people, the really, really great thing you can do with intersectionality is stratify that data along other axes. Are you bringing in a race lens? Are you bringing in a gender lens as well? So you're looking at the experience of disabled people, for instance, in reference to the healthcare system, for, in for instance, in reference to promotion, organization that you're further stratifying, obviously always in line with data privacy um, guidelines something so easy to do as long as you've got the right software and you've got the right minds working on it. The second thing you can do, which I think is really exciting, and there are some really great examples of these within companies, is when you're running events, there's so many great events run, to amplify the voices and stories of disabled people, to bring them into the mainstream. And that's fantastic and really important. We need to hear more from disabled members of our organizations and communities. And not just hear those stories, but have those stories be integrated into where power happens, essentially where decisions are made. Those voices need to be there as well. They need to be sat at that table. But you can bring intersectionality into this really beautifully. For example, if you're running an event on disability and disability awareness, who is being showcased? Whose story is being told? Whose voice is being amplified? Are there specific disability activists that you could speak to and obviously pay always to come into your organization, for instance, and share their story and share their recommendations with you, but also speak to the lived experience of disabled people who perhaps are people of color also, are women also, 
belong to the LGBTQIA plus community also. So bringing in a story that is nuanced and speaks to a wider lived reality as well. So you don't get a singular story, a singular voice. Intersectionality is exactly about that. It's not about saying we're only going to talk to these people or these people, but what about if we bring these stories together, etc. It's an enricher, it's an enhancer as a tool. To help you think through all of what Sara just shared with you when you're at your desk, your sofa, or what have you on another day, we have some questions for you to ask yourself. So if you want to, if you're working on making things more accessible, or if you're working, if you're saying to yourself, like, I've actually not thought about this in particular as it, rate, as it relates to disabled members in society, we have a few questions that you can ask yourself to begin to apply an intersectional lens to the work that you do with disabled communities, no matter what that work is. So I'm going to share the slide. And it's which voices and stories are you amplifying? And how does that inform our narratives about Surrey? So when we think back to that first slide that I showed with Stevie Wonder and Kanye, are we amplifying the voices of those who have physical disabilities only? Or are we amplifying the voices of the disabled community as a whole? So there could be individuals on that stage who have an invisible disability. So unless someone said to us, I have X, Y, Z, the audience would never know. So whose stories and voices are we amplifying? And even within that, are, do they, if, do we have a, a wide variety of voices? Do we have both men and women? Do we have members from the trans community? Do we have members from the LGB plus community? Do we have a wide range of voices being amplified and heard or are we only signifying a few? What defaults and norms do you cognitively go to when thinking about people's lived experiences of inequity. So this is more of a reflective question. When you say like, I want to work with disabled people, who's that default person that comes to your mind? Oftentimes it's someone in a wheelchair because of media and images that are shared. Okay, who are you missing if you only picture those in a wheelchair? I was thinking to myself recently on an elevator, I hit a button, because I had to go up. And I was like, I can't recall the last time I felt braille on an elevator. I can remember growing up feeling it. I don't feel it anymore. So like what defaults and norms do we think about when thinking about our disabled members of society? Folks with blindness have not disappeared, but braille has decreased, at least here in the United States. Something to think about. What complexity of experience and attached unique expectations are you missing? We very much highlighted for you that identity is complex. Humans are complex. People are complex. Systems of oppression and struggles manifest themselves in very complex ways, whether it's at the interpersonal level or structurally and systemically. So knowing that, when we're going to solutionize, are we going the easy route because it's faster and it's quicker? Or are we taking the time to say, wait, I might be missing out on parts of someone's identity and I might be operating in silos here when I should be leaning into thinking outside the box. Sara, is there anything else that you wanna share for questions that someone might wanna ask themselves? No, I love, I love what defaults and norms do you cognitively go to because it allows us to ask ourselves that question of who is my default notion of woman? Who is my default notion of disabled person, as you said? And what might that mean for which stories and which experiences am I consistently missing out because I don't go to that cognitively. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, because we are all in a world where siloed thinking is very prevalent, it pushes us into having those hierarchies, having those defaults. 
So we want to thank you for tuning in, for watching myself, Sable, Sara. I'm like this, like she's next to me. She's <laughs> next to me, but not next to me. Sara's actually in London right now. So I think that's the joy in, in, in virtual work because you can truly be anywhere when the time zones align. That doesn't always work out for certain time zones. But for New York and London, it works perfectly. Once again, we are Fearless Futures. You can connect with us at www.fearlessfutures.org. You can find us on Facebook. I have to do my fingers to make sure I get everything. Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Fearless Futures. And if you have a question or a concern, or maybe you're like, okay, I want to do more, then feel free to send us an email, organizations at fearlessfutures.org, British spelling, so a S, not a Z, organizations at fearlessfutures.org. Thanks, everyone. Bye.
Thank you for joining us on this presentation of Closed Captions at Pluto TV, which is a CVAA case study. The CVAA is the 21st Century Telecommunications and Video Accessibility Act. My name is Joe Devon, and back in 2008, American Idol changed my life. I know what you're thinking, but no, it's not because I'm a singer. You definitely don't want to hear that. But I was actually hired to help rebuild AmericanIdol.com. They used to joke, and it was true, that more people voted for American Idol than for the President of the United States. And that kind of came back because the Iowa caucuses had a bit of a problem with their voting app, which led Seth Meyers to quip, why did American Idol have a better system than actual America? Which we took as a source of pride because I was internal there, so were my coworkers. Uh, and we really put a lot of effort into architecting that system. But then back in 2012, with the team that worked on American Idol, I co-founded Diamond, and that has really been our focus, is building scalable software, a lot of video work for media companies that are inclusive. 
when we launched back in 2012, we started working on a lot of the same projects like American Idol, X Factor. We also did Simpsons World, got some other business from NFL, Disney, and other media companies. Here's an example of some of our clients. So around the same time, I also co-founded Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And this is celebrated every year, the third Thursday of May. And my co-founder in that was Jenison Ascension, with a lot, which a lot of folks in the accessibility community know. And it really took off to the point that it achieved a Twitter reach of almost 200 million users last May. And it took a while, you know, we, as a company, we had accessibility as a core value. However, we didn't feel like we had the chops right away. We really wanted to make sure that we had good enough chops and that we brought something unique to the table that other, other providers uh, didn't have in order to create an accessibility practice area. And we were very happy that last year we were able to launch this. And our, our thesis really is that there are the ability to do audits and things like that. But what was really needed is to have developers with chops and accessibility that build product accessibly from day one or if needed to remediate it. And one of the first projects we got was actually Pluto, which I will allow my team to talk about themselves. So with that, let me pass this along to James. Hi, my name is James Kenley and I'm a project manager here at Diamond. So we were tasked with the exciting but difficult project to audit and remediate accessibility issues with Pluto's closed captions. Like most projects, we were contacted with a problem statement. Pluto came to us and said, we would like to have accessible closed captions across all of our platforms that are currently in production. That's a pretty big ask. So first we needed to identify, what did that actually mean? What platforms did we have to remediate and audit? Well, at a first glance, Pluto comes across as a web player, uh, something that you can find on your iPhone or Android uh, mobile. But it extends far beyond that. Uh, in total, we found there were 52 platforms that we needed to audit and remediate. Now, this is a significant amount of work to actually go over and identify what the best pathway would be going forward. So that came to our planning phase. Planning for this project is a fundamental practice in project management so that we were able to identify a blueprint that allowed us to accomplish our goals within a set time. And being able to accomplish those goals within a set time, we also had to find the right resources. Now, when we think about 52 platforms um, in a specific time frame, how would we get the resources to be able to build and remediate a lot of those issues. Well, that particular practice was led by the team lead engineer, the partner and myself, the project manager, to assemble a team that was strong enough and understood the practices of accessibility to achieve the goals that were set in place. Now, all of this is, is fantastic to look at, but the real question here is the three main constraints of a project, that is time management, cost and quality. To compress something in a very short amount of time, being two months, both quality may come down and cost may increase. So we had to find a combination of these three particular components that Pluto were happy with so that we could deliver a product that was within budget, that was delivered on time, and that had the highest quality achievable um, within the given time frame. And so we came to the conclusion of being able to build a team of uh, around 10 staff that were to audit and remediate all of the work within uh, the two month given time frame for the project. So we come full circle and we look retrospectively on this project and we want to identify, is this project successful? What are the success criteria that enables us to say, yes, this was a successful project? Well, we can look at the cost and that we're under budget. We can look at the time and that, you know, we delivered the, the product within one day of the deadline. Uh, and we can look at the quality. And we can say that uh, we had uh, identified near to 100% of the closed captions accessibility issues across the project. Now, is that a successful project? Well, yeah, typically and historically in project management, you can classify those things as successful. But what is successful to us? 
successful to us is being able to teach and mentor the clients that we have to be more conscious about accessible practices and accessibility in their product in the future. So has Pluto adopted accessibility in the workplace? Well, yes, they have. With our implementation of accessibility practices, audits, and awareness, they have changed their perception of accessibility and been able to take a step forward to a more successful world, particularly with the products that they are developing. Now, what is success to us? Success is not only the management of time, cost, and quality, but also a cultural change in a company to ensure that they take the benefits of the lessons that have been learned in the development and audit cycle of these accessibility practices. It's important for us to understand the objective is not just to remediate accessibility issues, but to promote accessibility so that we won't have these issues in the future. Now we can look at Pluto as a fantastic example that shows us a company that is willing to take on an external challenge, a challenge that is unknown to them, to be able to bring a vendor like us to increase that awareness, to solve the problems that they have, and to be able to shift the cultural change in their company for the better. Hi, my name is Nick Schilling. I'm an engineering director here at Diamond. I was the one that led the accessibility audit and remediation work for this project. I worked with our dev teams and our QA teams to identify the issues that needed to be resolved and try to bring these apps into the world of accessibility. So which apps am I talking about? Our client was Pluto TV. Now, if you haven't heard of them, they're a free video streaming platform. You can go into their app, select one of the channels that is streaming a particular piece of content, and you can start watching it. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of what you want to watch, because if you know what the category of the content is you want to see, you can go right there and see it. Now, this app does fall into FCC guidelines. Even though it's a channel that's broadcasted over the internet, all this content has still been captioned previously. So those captions still need to be available for users so that they can watch the content, listen to the content, they can ingest this content. So this is amazing. We're so happy to be working on this project. The client Pluto, they have a new app that they've been working on. Now, the FCC's guidelines kick in a certain date. We need to be working on their legacy apps, which will still be live by the time that that date rolls around. So there's a hard deadline from the FCC to be CVA compliant by uh, January 1st, 2020. Because the new app isn't going to be ready by then, we need to make sure that their legacy apps have been updated so that they're fully compliant with caption requirements from the FCC. Remember, we're not actually replacing these apps. That's what the client is doing, but we are fixing them up. Now, keep this in mind when you're working with a client. You might not be able to replace an app for every single device. Some of those devices are incompatible with the technology that the client wants to adapt. You might find yourself in the situation, you might not. It really depends on what your business strategy is, but I think as we get farther and farther in, to understanding and, and accepting accessibility in this culture, we're going to need to have people who are changing apps and doing these accessibility audits. So this might not be applicable right away, but this might be applicable down the line. Also for clients, sometimes they might not be able to afford a whole replacement. Doing a, a top-down fix might actually be a lot more cost effective than doing a bottom up rebuild. In order to become compliant, you have to alter those legacy apps so that those are all brought into the 21st century. We wanna capture all of the requirements early on so we can be confident what we're delivering so that we know that they need what we're delivering. We had in-person meetings to get these requirements. If you can do these, which right now we have to do them all online, but in the future, I highly re recommend doing these in person. It's a lot easier to slow the pace down a bit so that you can get yourself into the mindset of the client. What are they looking for? What are their, what's their baseline for their legacy apps? Once you know what that is, 
that you can start to build a solution, a, a map forward, so you can get to the point where these apps are fully caption compliant. I'm not sure if you've seen the CVA guidelines for for uh, closed captions and for video stream platforms. Let's just say they're very dense. We can't just copy paste these documents right into Jira. No one would really understand and wouldn't really be actionable. Those requirements are built for lawyers to be able to look at something and say definitively, yes, this is compliant. No, this is not compliant. But these aren't action items. In order for a developer or a tester to be able to act on these requirements, we need to convert them into a testing strategy so that a tester can look at something that's been built, whether it's the original app or the app that's been fixed by developers, and say, yes, this is now compliant. We need to start coming up with a testing strategy. So first step is to find out the full matrix of devices and platforms and code bases. So devices would be anything from a computer to a phone to a TV. Platforms might be individual variants on those devices. And then the code bases are what populate those devices with those applications. So first we have browsers. This is our wheelhouse. At Diamond, we are very capable of building out websites. So this is something that is a known quantity for us. But we have to test every website with the video playback on every major browser, which I've listed here, including Internet Explorer. <laughs> Alongside this, like I said, are also set-top boxes, things that you can plug into your television. So you have the Roku, Apple TV, you have the PlayStation, you have Amazon Fire Stick. There's a lot more devices. I didn't want to put them all in my list. But as you can imagine, if you were to go to a tech store and start cruising around, there are a lot of options. Speaking of a lot of options, we also have smart TVs and phones. There are a lot of different phones. There are a lot of different smart TVs. Thankfully for phones, you really just have to look at iPad, iPhone, some Android phone, and then some Android tablet. Because these device makers at least understand, well, there's going to be a lot of variants here. Let's just try to make things simple for people. Because developers aren't going to be able to buy 40 phones. And then for, for TVs, we have like a Samsung we have a Roku TV, which has like the Roku built into it. There's a lot of complexity that comes with testing and developing on a smart TV because a lot of testing and development has to happen on the actual physical device. Now, that might not seem like a big, a big deal, but you think about how big TVs are and you think about how many TVs there are out there. That is quite a bit of work. In order to start, now that we know what we're doing, we have to build up the right team development team who has experience across all these different platforms or at the very least who could learn quickly how to work in these platforms some of these tech like platforms that that we had to touch there was no way that anyone else could have worked in them especially the smart tvs our testing team also had to be available locally to build a test on those physical devices our devs would be working in the client's code bases to fix issues that were found during that audit by our qa team i want to really drive home that if you have a daunting feeling project, the last thing you want to do is try something new and try to uh, reinvent the wheel. If you have a system that's in place for capturing work, for, for capturing tests, you should just use that methodology. There's no reason to throw something away to work faster because if you throw something away that, that everyone's used to, and then you start something brand new, your team's not going to be used to that. And so there's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be some confusion. So sticking with what you know, sticking with what the team knows is a good way to make sure that you can actually get the work done. We couldn't be at the Pluto offices every day. They have beautiful offices very far away from my house, <laughs> very far away from most of our homes. So we did as much as we could at home, and we did as much as we could in our offices. Some of these devices were very easy to get our hands on. We could test on our phones. We could test on uh, our gaming consoles. But there's some specialized devices that are very hard to get a handle on, like the 2015 Samsung Orsay television. 
If you hear that, do you know where to get one? We didn't either. It's critical that all of our testers were on the same page about what the accessibility requirements actually were. The standardized test tickets that we wrote, which I covered in a previous slide, went a long way here because we were able to let the testers know what they needed to look out for, what they were actually trying to review. Now, if this is different than, than everybody understanding what accessibility requirements are, because you can understand what the CBA requirements are, but we need to also understand how they apply to the actual project. Once testing was completed, we wanted to make sure that we had a pile of actionable tickets. Devs shouldn't be blocked when they're starting on work. So the tickets that are, that are created have to include everything that they need to know in order to start their work. In order to facilitate this, our tickets included screenshots and videos capturing all the test cases. So developers know what they need to fix. Now that we have a set of actionable tickets, what do you do now? How, where, do, where do you do this work? Because you can know what apps are available, but how do you know what the code bases are? Now, the tricky part of that legacy apps is that these are applications that are built by previous development teams. Some of these dev teams, some of these, some of this knowledge might be lost over time because these old dev teams might not be around anymore, or someone might not remember. I sometimes can't remember what I did last week. I'm not going to expect someone to remember what they typed two years ago. So this stuff sort of required some digging, trying to find where are these code bases? How do, where do we make these changes? Developers who are working across these separate platforms, we had to make sure that they were all still on the same page. Like I said with our testers, every, someone might understand the goal, but we want to make sure that the process is smooth enough that everybody is working together, even though everyone's sort of working on their own. Um, we had to make sure the process was clearly communicated to developers. Um, they had to be sharing tips and successes. We don't want the day-to-day -to, -day to feel like everyone's in isolation. Because if you're working on all these separate code bases, chances are you're not going to have a full development team. You're going to have individual developers doing their work. Um, and finally, to, to consider accessibility decisions needed to be seen cross-platform. So if we made a decision about how menu should be handled or how a guide should be displayed or hidden, those decisions ought to be cross-platform so that if a user opens up the app on iOS, it should really have the same accessibility considerations that it does on Android. Since we're delivering code to the client developers, we wanted to keep them in the loop when we're, when we're committing our code changes. So we included them on all of our code reviews when requested so that we could make sure that their coding practices are followed. Because of the tight deadline, the last thing we wanted to do is dump a bunch of changes in their laps and then have them come back and say, we actually did it this other way and we want you guys to change it. So we kept on top of that by keeping in constant communication with them. When you're working with a client like that, who has an external development team, make sure to keep in communication with them so that uh, nothing gets lost. Um, while we were making these changes, we did hand off code and some, some of those changes that we made, we thought, oh, these are gonna be good for accessibility, but they broke expected user flows. There was a specific example that I can think of where we wanted to be able to turn on closed captioning right after opening up a video feed off of a TV app. Now, this updated flow that we made seemed like a great idea, but the product team flagged it once we made these changes, because the expected user flow is completely different than what we were expecting. If you're doing this on your projects, what you want to keep in mind is that the client needs to be kept in the loop if you're going to be making breaking changes. A lot of accessibility changes aren't breaking, you know, adding ARIA tags, adding closed captions, making sure that like buttons are accessible. But if you need to change the way that the user flows through the application, the last thing you want to do is make those changes in a bubble because you're eventually going to be delivering those changes back to the client. So if you bring up those, those breaking changes early, as early as you can, you will save yourself a big headache in the long run. I want to tell you guys a story. 
about the strangest case, the case of the disappearing captions. We would have captions disappearing about 10 minutes after playback started. Very, very strange. Definitely didn't, didn't want that. It was actually an issue that was blocking an app from being approved by one of these platforms. What would be causing this? Well, if you thought that only one issue would be causing this, you're close. There was actually at least three different issues causing this problem. The first issue was that legacy code was removing captions after a while. I believe it was after the ad break ended to display a captions coming soon block. Having the problem only appear after commercials makes it very difficult to test, which makes it very difficult to track down. <laughs> this is a case where I don't think we really could have prepared for, for something like that because you wouldn't expect for the code to be actively removing captions from the view. The second issue that we ran into was that sometimes the server might re return one of the captions files as a what they call a 404. This just means that the file is not available from the server. If there's a lot of traffic or if the user's connection is spotty on their device or maybe at their house even, some of these files might not download. So that's why you see like buffering issues on videos. The problem was that when the code was encountering those, those errors, it thought that, oh, captions are gone. Might as well delete captions forever. So we had to sort of add some structure around this so that there was actually some real logical error handling of these captions. The reason why these uh, errors were in the place in the first place was that captions weren't being rendered on all these platforms. And so when, once we added them in, these problems started to crop up. The third problem we ran into, I think was probably the most surprising one because the apps, a lot of the apps were using what is called the HLS video player. Um, this is a fairly popular web video streaming platform. A lot of devices use it, a lot of websites use it, but it has some strange bugs in it. There were some buffer issues, which means that the data is becomes out of sync if too much data is taken in. It was causing captions to be downloaded and then not be displayed because playback had already gotten past that point. Captions would come in, but they'd come in half a second too late or a tenth of a second too late, and it wouldn't trigger. Memory issues were causing the player to crash if too many captions had been downloaded. There was no garbage collection is what they call it where old files are removed because new files are coming in. This player was just holding onto everything, which doesn't feel like a problem until you're testing on an older device and you're testing for half an hour. We investigated these issues and the client had their dev teams check into this and they provided us a fixed player that resolved all these problems. So we're in the final stretch now. We're preparing for release. Now these player fixes, because they required essentially what they call waterfall flow for development, where the, the one team works and does their, their part of the task, and then they hand off the work to the next part of it to be complete and so on and so forth. By the time that we received the actual fixed player, we were about two weeks out from launch. So we were integrating these changes sort of at the last second. And there were some integration issues that we ran into. On one TV, we saw everything working fine until we did a final integration with the player and some of our shared libraries, we ran into some issues. So that's expected, I would say, because if you have a lot of devices and you have a lot of shared libraries, it's going to be difficult for you to test every single iteration of, of all of those devices because the shared library, the, the common code that everyone pulls from, it might be updated in some scenario, like for some app flows, but because the developer teams are working independently, not all of them might know that that shared code had been updated. Another issue we ran into, this is a very small one. On the Chromecast device, there were old changes that were left up from previous work that had never been launched. And we didn't know that. So we were building off of those old changes. Now those old changes actually had changes to the player so they weren't changes that could just be rolled back, but these were never launched up to production. 
It was completely unexpected, but we had some conversations with a client and they were fine with that. They gave us the go ahead after we sort of walked them through what the impact was that we were perceiving from these changes. What I wanna underline here is how important it is to have conversations with the client. You wanna provide them with enough information to make an informed decision while also providing your suggestions based on your research. You don't want to just give them a, the, the full decision where they don't know what, what the consequences are because you're the one that's just working in the code. Uh, finally, we've packaged up our work, and we've sent it to the client. That feels great. This is a, a huge win. We feel very happy with the work that we've done for the, for the client and, and the work that we put into these apps and captions are working completely as expected. So I will hand it off to Michael now. Hello, my name is Michael Mistak. I'm an accessibility manager here at Diamond. And what we wanna talk about today specifically is what makes up a logically planned plan of attack for retrofitting in captions. What are some of the tasks that by knowing the full scope of the project and knowing what tasks we are going to need to challenge our team with, what are those items that outside of the technical challenge are also going to require uh, a, a decent amount of deliberation and it would behoove us to get those types of decisions to the appropriate decision makers ahead of time so that as we're executing against uh, those tasks that are more clear cut, these types of problems have the opportunity to gestate, to get to a state of completion before critical portions of the project will work at and need to start implementing the decisions those folks are making. And some of the things that we learn from this project and others are just some examples that we came across and I think can serve as uh, kind of learning opportunities uh, for you to again take a look at projects ahead of you and, and being able to identify these tasks and again get them to the decision makers before you start hitting critical time crunches. Examples that, that we're going to highlight on are you know, looking at remote control interface conventions, looking at uh, screen real estate concerns and where adding in functionality after the fact might give you some challenges there. But also looking at some of the logistics around standardizing uh, caption standards. And then kind of finally, and I think in, co in conclusion very purposefully, is taking a look at how you can, for your own projects and with your clients, set up and follow a decision-making framework that's demonstrative of maturity of organization, uh, maturity of accessibility knowledge generally, and captioning standards specifically. Now in a project such as this and supporting the digital ecosystem that we all see out in the world, we know that it's made up of many different types of devices. Those devices themselves either have their own types of control conventions or have remotes or other types of control devices that in and of themselves have their own different types of design and control eccentricities. It's important to really kind of understand, you know, what are the standards that exist within these types of devices ahead of time and how are we going to um, apply similar controls for functionalities within our application. And again, since we are in fact retrofitting, are there going to be times when some of those existing patterns or the patterns, let's say, that we would trend towards naturally in order to do a specific function, for example, toggling on captions, toggling off captions, are some of the standard ways in which those are done um, already taken by other functionality within our application. Do we have to take opportunities to maybe move some of that functionality or do we have to come up with intuitive ways of accomplishing those same tasks 
but within the framework of our application. Again, retrofitting those these functions in later, you know, we, we might find a opportunity where we're going to need to negotiate the different landscape of controls that are available within the devices. And more than likely, we're going to need to engage some of the decision makers for that project well ahead of, well near the beginning if possible. So again, so these decisions can be made while we're doing other critical work. And again, when it comes time to implement these types of functionalities, we'll be ready, we'll have the decisions made, and we'll be able to proceed. As I stated in my introduction, another area that we'd likely have to make some important deliberations around when you find yourself in a position where you're going to be uh, retrofitting in captions specifically, but in, in a lot of instances of uh, functionality in general, are how space is being used on the screen. As, as much as it's generally true that within the digital realm you're dealing with fairly infinite real estate, when you're dealing with applications where there's not, you know, scrolling or whatnot, there, there actually is a fairly finite amount of real estate that we're dealing with. Components such as a video player uh, designed previously without accommodations in mind may be in fact using some of the space that we would uh, tend to want to use for functionality such as captioning menus or the captions themselves. So you're going to have content and functionality competing for physical space within your screen. We're going to need to identify those issues early on, uh, communi document and communicate the challenges that that type of competition for screen real estate is going to pose. And again, engage the decision makers who are ultimately going to have to agree on, again, the suite of functionality and how we implement it. And, you know, how is that going to look? How is that going to lay out? How is that going to be represented on screen in a way that's ultimately going to continue to be intuitive as, a, as an app holistically, but again, specifically within the realm of the assistive uh, technology that we're looking to implement in the form of captions. Another area that is, is likely going to come up, particularly if you find yourself in a position where uh, you're working within an application space that has a wide variety of content sources, where the captions that come with those different pieces of content from those different sources more than likely might come with some of their own variation of competing standards or use of those standards uh, and how captions are, themselves are provided. Once you spent um, a decent amount of time uh, within the captioning space, you invariably come to the understanding that you know, the evolving standards that support captioning and the providing of captioning have in and of themselves different abilities and different features available for the user. The one feature that, well, one of the features that was particularly important in terms of uh, supporting our project's need to be compliant with CVAA was the standard within 708 that provided the ability to position the caption in different places on the screen so that the captions, when, when needed, aren't obscuring, say, chirons at the bottom of news programs, the uh, mouth of the speaker, the face of the speaker, or key action that is happening on screen. In order to push the system in general for consistency sake, but also for the sake of complying with CBAA, you know, we had to make recommendations around what is the path towards commonization? What's going to be the incentive structure that's going to 
have all of your content providers who, depending on how their content's being used right now, may not have previously needed to worry, let's say, about the feature set that's available in 708 that isn't available in the 608 standard. So, you know, making those recommendations for the business to be able to, whether it's a incentive structure or some sort of some sort of uh, penalty of non-compliance with the 708 standard so that within a reasonable amount of time, both for them as a business and for the SEC, that all captions throughout the system would be available with the positioning that's made um, possible within the 708 guidelines. Now we've just covered three you know, decent sized opportunities to quite frankly make our lives easier as a project. We've taken a look at three types of kind of broad decisions where we realize that let's say we as a technical team or we as a team implementing uh, a retrofitting of captions into an application won't necessarily be the final authority necessary to make some of the logistical decisions that are going to be important for us to eventually successfully complete our work. But the fourth item that I want to discuss and to highlight are kind of is something more holistic. You know, what are some of the things that we know having worked on projects, whether that's within the captioning space or within accessibility more broadly, what are those decisions that we've come to recognize as ones where someone might have a question about this later. Someone might disagree with some of the decision making that we made um, in good faith using the best professional judgment that we had available and top-notch technical and design acumen, you know, necessary to, again, make a system that generally adheres to good user experience principles, but specifically implements captioning and other types of user accommodations, um, not only well, but in a way that users who need them will, will believe that the, or understand that the same care in the user experience was taken to provide them with a top-notch experience. You know, sometimes even with all of that, there may be disagreements with the decisions that were made in order to make those types of accommodations within the system. There might be individuals whose combination of disabilities might not be as well served by what we provided and how we provided it as we hoped. But what really kind of is the hallmark of a mature team looking to achieve accessibility using captions or, or outside of that realm is being able to demonstrate a decision-making framework that is not only sound but is applied consistently and adjusts when necessary. So within this space generally or specifically, you know, what are some of the decisions that we think might come across our docket? What is the appropriate way to research the appropriate ways to face those challenges, to make decisions that we think best serve the user? But I think most importantly for us as an organization looking to achieve these goals, again, consistently and in the user's best interest, being able to not only document what we were trying to do, what we learned in getting there, but then again, the criteria that we followed to make those decisions. So again, if uh, time goes by, someone challenges the way the decisions that were made, or you know, brings uh, some sort of uh, legal challenge, to our assertion that we've done the work to support our users, we'll be able to, again, demonstrate in whatever venue that you know we've done the work and we have uh, documentation 
and a quote unquote digital paper trail that backs that assertion up. Again, not only from the perspective that we want to uh, protect ourselves and protect our clients, but that we want to be able to demonstrate when these types of questions do come up that we are working on the, the behalf of the best interests um, of our end users. You know, this type of decision making, this type of uh, framework to achieve that decision making and the, the consistency of using that, you know, almost like a machine is the, you know, the hallmark of a mature organization that's using deliberative processes, using them consistently and maturely. You're looking for the goals that in general, an accessibility program office would be looking to achieve. Again, so that you know you can prove that your work is above reproach and more importantly for our users, be able to examine some of that decision making, analyze whether or not maybe in a certain circumstance, some of the rationale that was used may not in fact be sound, as sound in retrospect, or whether particularly maybe we didn't have all the information that was necessary to craft the solution that we now will understand is appropriate. And being able to look back on this, look back on our decision making, look back on our process, seeing how it may not have served a, a particular set of users, be able to make the adjustments, make that kind of continuous learning not only within individual practitioners, but within your organization at large. Thank you, team. So in conclusion, succeeding in a project like this would not be possible without proper planning. There's a strong temptation when you have so much work to do, so many devices, such a large team to just jump in and get started. But if you don't do that with a plan, you are going to plan to fail. So you need to create a solid testing plan, figure out how you're going to be implementing fixes while new product is being developed, uh, figure out how to maintain it. Essentially, it is like you're fixing the engine of a, of a running train. Uh, it, is, it is extremely challenging. And it's important to identify and front load a long tasks that have long lead times, particularly if they quiet, require stakeholder deliberation. And last, but certainly not least, accessibility is a journey and not a destination. And we're fortunate that the Pluto executive team from the top down has decided that accessibility is going to be core value for them. And they have created processes in place in order to make this part of how they are developing their product in the future. So this was a really big win and we were really happy to be working on this project. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome to A Future Date. My name is Dax Castro, and I'm a certified digital accessibility specialist with more than 20 years experience using Adobe InDesign. My presentation today is on advanced Adobe InDesign techniques for richer AT experience. And AT experience stands for assistive technology. So the goal of today's presentation is to give you some advanced tips and techniques that you can use using Adobe InDesign when you're creating infographics and other graphics so that people using screen readers or other assistive technology can digest them easier and get more information from them. So if you're in the accessibility space or you just wanna make clearer infographics, stick around because I've got some tips to show you. Let's dive right in. All right, so the first thing you wanna do is get a plan. Usually an infographic is not a standalone piece, but it's part of a bigger project. So if we take a look at this little flowchart here, we have our overall graphic style and color. So that's one of the first things that you wanna detail out. You wanna make sure you have a good understanding about what style and what colors you're gonna use. You wanna use a color palette that's gonna be colorblind friendly. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have a nice high contrast, and you wanna make sure that your overall style is well thought out because there's nothing worse than getting into a document and then finding out halfway through that you didn't think how the document was gonna to flow together. The next thing you wanna concern yourself with are the images, charts, and graphs. They're gonna take the most work. They're gonna take the most thought. So as you start laying out your document, identify where those images and infographics and charts are gonna be so that as you hand them off to your team or you start your storyboarding, it all kind of starts to flow together and you're able to start walking through some of those accessibility questions you need to ask yourself like, is this the best way to present this information? Are we supporting our charts and graphs with body text? Those types of things. The next thing you wanna be concerned about are your tables. Are your tables gonna be spanning multiple pages? Are you using them simply as a layout object to lay out text on a page? Do your tables make logical sense? Do you have merge cells in them that are gonna create a difficult user experience or a difficult experience for you when you're trying to make them accessible? And of course, finally, the text content. And text really is pretty easy because really we're concerned with heading structure, lists, and making sure that we have a good flow, that we're supporting our infographics and our tables, that we've got nice headings and captions, all of those things are pretty low hanging fruit. The thing that is most intriguing is people's approach to infographics. And sometimes they take a really great approach and other times there's a lot to be said for what they can do to improve them. Once you identify all the pieces and parts of your document, then you start going through changes and revisions. You'll create your accessible PDF draft and start working through some of the issues there. Then you'll go through it and you'll make your final copy and you'll get it approved and you'll post it and someone invariably will want to change something. Usually it's something detrimental that's going to change a page number or change the way the document flows, something that's gonna require you to go back. So what we wanna to try to do when we're creating accessible PDFs or accessible documents is when we're in InDesign, we wanna do as much as we possibly can in InDesign to make sure that that document is accessible. And especially when we're talking about infographics, we wanna make sure that we do as much as we can within the program so that when we get to that PDF stage, we're not having to do a bunch of heavy lifting. All right, let's move to the next slide here. When we talk about infographics, there are three main things we need to consider. One, color and shape, two, text and context, and three, read order. We wanna make sure that our colors are colorblind friendly, that we're using good enough contrast, and that we're using shapes as well as colors, line styles, and other things to differentiate the different pieces of information. The next thing we wanna make sure is that we're supporting our infographics with body text, that we're using text within the document to tell the user what we're hoping they're going to get out of this infographic. There's nothing worse than presenting this super complex infographic where you think they're just gonna get it right away and see all these different complex thoughts and ideas, but really you haven't given them enough information. You haven't led them down the road you want them to go. So using context is super important when you're presenting an infographic. And the last one is read order. Read order is important because we wanna make sure that we present that infographic in a way that makes sense to the user, right? We want them to be able to read the document easily and not all of a sudden in the middle of a document go down to this other figure and then have to come back. Sometimes that can create a navigation uh, issue with someone who may not be familiar with how to use assistive technology very well. Other times uh, it creates a fragmented experience where they're in the middle of reading a sentence and all of a sudden they get bounced out to an infographic and then they have to hear long alt text and then bounce right back. So typical good practice for presenting infographics and graphics in general is to present them at the beginning of a paragraph, 
or at the end of a paragraph or the end of a section or the beginning of a section so that you give them uh, a reasonable flow and understandable flow so that they're not having to break in the middle of a sentence and go look at something complex and then come back. So when we talk about color and shape, well, CAG has something to say about that. The success criteria 1.4.1 says the use of color is not the only visual means of conveying information, indicating an action, a prompt or response, or distinguishing a visual element. Now, a lot of these things have to do with HTML, but the one that's most important for us as document designers is distinguishing a visual element. And I think distinguishing is the key point here because so many people want to take a map or a chart or a graph and say every single piece of that chart or graph has to have a three to one color contrast ratio because of non-text contrast rules. Um, or they want to make sure that everything has a bunch of different pattern fills in it. There are ways that you can create infographics elegantly that still comply with the CAG success criteria that allow you to have some flexibility by the use of labels and the use of line style and the use of uh, uh, being able to identify what the important information is. Remember, this is about the important information in an infographic. So if you're looking at a map, it doesn't mean that every single piece of data on that map has to be explained somehow, or it has to be have these crazy color contrast ratios. We're talking about what is the main takeaway you wanna give that user when they're looking at your infographic. One of my big pet peeves is colorblind design. We don't think about the 8% on average of male population out there that are colorblind. Now it's much lower percent, almost 1% in females. And in uh, black populations, it is uh, very low. And in white populations, it's very high. And that's all around the world. The thing we have to remember is we often use red for closed or don't go this way or danger and green for open or go this way. And, and those visual cues are okay for people who can tell the difference between red and green. But if you look at this slide, can you tell me which one's red and green? Can you see in here which ones of these squares have red fills and which ones have green fills? I know I can't, right? So it's super important that as we design, we use context clues other than simply color to differentiate between two different items. So let's take a look at what this chart is supposed to look like. All right, so this looks a lot better, right? We can tell the difference now between the orange and the red and the green and the yellow. Now, although there are colorblind apps out there that will allow you to analyze your images to find out whether or not they're colorblind friendly or how it's gonna look in colorblind mode, Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator actually has a colorblind mode built into it. So if we go into Illustrator here, and we go up to view and then proof setup, we can see that we have color blindness in two different modes. We have protonopia and we have deuteranopia. Now deuteranopia is the most prevalent color blindness. It's that red green color blindness that we were talking about earlier, right? So if we turn this on, we can see that immediately we can see that there is no difference between the red and green. They're literally virtually indistinguishable. And honestly, there's no difference between the, almost no difference between the yellow and the orange. And you can barely see that blue line that's around the outside compared to the gray background, right? So we want to make sure that we use colors that are going to have good contrast and that we're not just using color only. So let's take a look again at the InDesign file and see if we can't make some sense of this uh, format that they were trying to accomplish. So if we look at our legend here, we can see that they have good labeling in that they have an, a number or a letter inside of their shape and they're using different shapes, which is great because they're using a text identifier and they're using shape. But then the problem becomes they have A, B, C, D, E, and F but they're all just different colors. And that's where the problem lies, right? And then if you look at the impact, the impact shows that there is a white with a black outline and then a white with a blue outline, but really they probably just meant no outline versus having an outline, right? So let's take a look and see what we can do to fix this. So if we look down here, we can see the first thing we did here is that we added some letters to the to these items. So if we just add A, and we might have to fix our, our font size here just slightly so that it fits uh, within there, right? Let's cheat here a little bit just for brevity. Uh, so now we have one A, two, 
Well, 2B would be green, right? So we can, um, let's just, this would be 2F, let's just say, right? And 3F and 4 would be E, right? And we can see here that this white it doesn't have enough color contrast against this orange. Now, how do we know that? Well, we use this tool and it's a tool, it's one of my favorite tools. It's the Color Contrast Analyzer. Now this tool allows us to use some eyedroppers that overlays on any uh, program out there so it works great. You don't have to worry about eye dropping and pasting to the web or anything like that. Uh, and the way it works is we've got foreground at the top and background at the bottom and we've got these eyedroppers here. So if we're looking at this orange color, we wanna pick our foreground as orange and then we wanna pick our background as white and it is. And you can see we fail all the way across the board. Right? So how do we get a good color contrast? Well, I happen to know that black against orange is uh, definitely higher color contrast, but if we wanted to see what color orange we needed to get to get a good color contrast, if we could, we can open up these little sliders here and hit synchronize color values and start dragging these left. The problem is, is that it only goes so far left and we still fail in every one of these ranges. So then sometimes you have to do unsynchronize and then you start playing with the colors. Like if I go to there, I can kind of get large text to pass, but now we're out of this color range and you can really just drive yourself nuts, right? So if we go back and resample that color, the better way would be to change the text color, right? So what would we need to do? The easiest way would simply be to make this text color black. And then you can see we pass all the way across the board, all the different uh, AA or AAA, we're good to go. So that's the easy lift there, right? So let's go ahead and do that and we're good to go there. So let's go ahead and check this green. So our background color is green, our foreground color is white, and you can see we pass all but the regular text for AAA, and we're not trying to meet AAA, we're just trying to meet AA, so we're good to go. Now, let's just say I accidentally switched, uh, click the foreground color or the background color. You have this little flip-flop right here that you can click on that little icon, and it will switch from foreground to background, but it doesn't really make a difference. Um, here it's showing you that there's a text sample and an infographic sample. Um, this tool's a great tool to use. I use it all the time. All right, so now we just need to make this text color black. And we're good to go there. So now we have our text is in line. We have good color contrast, but this background color, the background color we didn't check and we really should have. So if we look at this orange color as our foreground color and this gray color as our background color, we can see it definitely doesn't pass. So what are we gonna do? Let's go ahead and darken up the background and see if that doesn't help. So let's um, go ahead and resample this color and then hit synchronize and then start dragging this left until we start seeing green check marks. And oh, there's one for large text and there we go. So this is the color. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this without the hashtag right there. And then we are going to go over to our color palette. We're gonna select our back, that little background swatch, double click, and then we're gonna paste that color in and now we hit okay, and right away you can see it immediately looks much clearer and much more distinct here in the bottom graphic, right? Now, this blue line, is there something we have to do with the blue line? Well, we said color only. Well, the, the, the thing here is, is that there's only one outline. It's either outlined or not outlined. If, let's just say, this other one was a white outline, then we would have to go through and make one of these have a pattern of some sort. So we probably would make the blue or the white. We could go through and make the white stroke and make it a dash. We could make it a bigger dash or a smaller dash. And now you definitely have color contrast or another way, another means of differentiating between one stroke and another that isn't color only. So our second means of variation for infographics is text and context, right? And what does WCAG have to say about text? Well, 1.4.5 images of a text says, if technology is being used, can achieve the visual presentation, 
text is used to convey information rather than images of text. So what that basically means is if you have the ability to represent text as actual readable text, then you should do that instead of presenting text as images. Now, in an infographic, if the whole thing's a PNG or a JPEG, you have, you have some text on, let's just say a map, for instance, it's going to be an image, right? But that goes back to relevant information. What are we trying to relay? When you're trying to create alt text for a map or you're trying to uh, think about how this infographic is going to be presented, is there a way that you can walk through that text without it all having to be an image? There is, and we're gonna cover that in just a minute. So thank you so much for sticking with me. All right, now on to images of text, right? So what's the definition of images of text? Well, on the left, we've got this great infographic and we can see here that we've got text inside. Now it looks like a table, but it's actually not. Um, this is a visual graphic that was created. And in here, all of this text happens to be readable, selectable text. So this would not qualify as image of text, but it could if it were an image, a PNG placed inside of a document, which would be probably pretty typical for most of you out there um, to create an infographic this way because that's what you've always done. But I'm gonna show you a way where you're able to actually allow the user to walk through this data in a better way. So here you can see this other image is an image of a street sign, a construction sign actually, and it has text on it, but it's a photograph of text on a sign. So it's not, it's, it's by definition image of text, but that's where alt text comes in. And so you would create alt text that reads what this sign is if it's relevant. Maybe the text that's on the sign really isn't the relevant part, but it's the idea that there is construction going on in the Central Valley. Right now here they have alt text that starts with the word photo. And of course, best practices tell us that we should never really start your graphic with the word graphic of or photo of because it's going to, depending upon your screen reader, announce graphic before or after at the end of the alt text. So unless it's germane like pie chart of or bar graph of, you want them to give, some, you're trying to give them context as to what it is that you're actually presenting them with, you really should stay away from starting your alt text with the word graphic or photo because they assume that. All right, now, what does WCAG have to say about read order? Well, read order is, is information and relationships and that's WCAG uh, success criteria 1.3.1, which says information, structure, and relationships conveyed through presentation can be programmatically determined or are available in text. In other words, if you're going to have an infographic inside your document, you want it to be logical. You want to have a read order that makes sense. And we talked about where that infographic would sit, right? Do you want it in the middle of the paragraph? So in the middle of a sentence, all of a sudden they're bounced out to this infographic and then bounced back? Probably not. Most of the time you want to finish your thought or you want to start with, you know, a, a introductory text that says the following is an infographic of blah, 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 and explains what you're trying to expect the reader to get away, to take away from that infographic. So remember, your body text should support your infographic. Now that doesn't mean that your infographic has to be an image or that it has to be a PNG, something flat with just some alt text in it. There are ways to be able to walk through that and we're gonna get there, right? So how do we get there? We get there with tags, right? So at our disposal, we have quite a few tags that we can use. Now we have document and part and div and all of these container tags that aren't really read by a screen reader. And then of course we've got all our heading levels and then we've got some inline elements like form or figure. Of course, figure is the one we're most interested in. Uh, but not all of these tags are read by screen readers, right? So the tools that we have to use in InDesign are a little more constricted. So we've got heading levels and figure and link and span and list and uh, all your table stuff. So all of this is kind of at our disposal. So we have to be pretty judicious about how we use the different tags in order to create a, a good user experience for those using assistive technology because these tags are going to be how they understand the information and relationships of that information in our document. Now, this is the way, right? Now, what I'm getting ready to show you are some tips and techniques on how to create some infographics, but it is not the only way. There are lots of ways to create graphics that are accessible. 
And just because I have spoken, because I have said it, doesn't mean it is the only way. I want to reiterate that. There are lots of ways to create accessible infographics. So just take what I I'm giving you with a grain of salt, adapt it, use it to be able to think about your process and how your infographic could be made to be something more than just simply a JPEG or a PNG stuck in your document with a piece of alt text on it. Because it doesn't have to be that way. In a large majority of the cases, there are ways around it, but sometimes there's not enough time. Sometimes you can't get buy-in from somebody else to be able to do things like include a table. But there are ways to include a table without having to change your layout at all. And we're going to cover that as well. All right. So how do we control the flow of information inside our InDesign document? We use anchors and layers, articles and threads, and then we have... We want to talk about labels versus fills. Labels versus fills is a way to answer the success criteria for WCAG that says color cannot be the only means of differentiating. If we include labels in some pretty specific ways, we can get away from having to be forced to add a bunch of dots and slashes and hashes to all of our different fills for things like bar charts and pie charts. So let's take a look at this infographic here. So here we can see that we've got some boxes. We can thread this text. It doesn't have to stay one single image. We can take the background from the image and put it on a different layer uh, so that we can artifact it when it comes that time. Uh, and then we're going to thread each of these text boxes so that we start with project visual and initial design, and then step two, review, step three, refinement, and on and on. So you're able to give the person using assistive technology the exact text that's in the document, the way it is visually. You don't need to know alt text that says, image of right arrow, image of brown right arrow, image of green right arrow, that's inconsequential. The idea is you're walking them through a series of steps. This could be a bulleted list that's styled in a very a different way. It's up to you. The idea here is that you can separate the graphic element from the text element and present them both because to the flat user, to the person who's visually digesting this document, it's not going to look any different. But to a person using assistive technology, it's going to be a hugely different experience than to have to sit and listen to alt text. They can sit and actually walk through the data the same way you and I would, which is great. So the first thing we're going to do is open up the articles panel. I'm not sure if many of you have actually even know that this tool is in here. So if you go up to window, and then articles, it's the very first one, right? So we click on that and now we have this panel. But what we can do with this panel is so powerful. We can take these document, these items and we can drag them into the articles panel in the order that we want them to appear in the tag tree. Now this doesn't really work very well for 100 page documents or for you know things that are long publications uh, without a lot of effort, but for single page flyers or just a couple of pages, this might be the way to go. Right? So you can drag these just by simply clicking on and holding down the left mouse button and dragging your text box into the articles panel and letting go. It's going to ask you, what do I want to call this? And we're going to call this Project Viz. Right? And then we're going to hit OK. Now, you can see here in the articles panel that we've got this name and it tells you what's underneath there. And I can go ahead and now I could do this one of a couple of different ways. And the way I would probably do it, since this is all one unified thought, is I would add to that existing uh, item that we've made in the tags tree. So I can grab that tech, the next box and drag it right underneath there and hit and let go. Now it's going to add that second box into my articles panel. Now we can do the same thing for the third one and drag it right up underneath there and let go. Now, if we were to drag it out into the middle down here underneath our, our list and let go, it's going to try to ask us for a new item name. That's because we dragged it away from that other list. You want to make sure that when you drag this up into your uh, articles panel, that if you want it to be part of an existing article section, then you want to make sure that you see that little gray line. If you don't see that little gray line and you let go, it's going to ask you for another name, right? And so that may or may not be what you want from a reading order standpoint. So the articles panel is a great way to organize content by simply dragging them into the panel in the order in which you want them to appear. 
what will happen is in your tag tree, inside your PDF, you will see a section or a group with that name that you named it inside your InDesign document. So it makes it much easier when you're trying to reorganize or maybe edit or uh, walk through your tags tree. It allows you to see those labels. They aren't read by a screen reader. They're simply for your information only. But it allows you to sort and group all of this content in the way you want to. All right, let's take a look at another example. Here we have an org chart, and so many times I see people ask me questions about org charts. How do I represent an org chart? How am I supposed to write alt text for an org chart? Well, the answer it might surprise you, right? Because there are a couple of different ways you can handle this. You can create a list. When you're in Word and you create these uh, org charts inside Word, you really do start with an outline first. You start with a bulleted list and then you use the little wiz wizard to generate your org chart and it's great. Well, why not just take that org chart outline, that, that set of bullets, and include that in your document so that you're providing alternate content? But sometimes you don't want that list to be seen by the visual user. You just want it there for the accessible person using assistive technology. And there's a way to do that. So stay tuned here. We're going to get to it. I promise you. All right. So the other way we can handle this org chart is by using threads. You could walk through each of the different things in a logical way. Right. You could use body copy like we talked about, where you can take that list and start walking through in a paragraph format and say the natural environment is divided into to five subcategories, land, vegetation, atmospheric, water, and animals. So you can use text to be able to relate that visual information that your org chart is presenting. Uh, the other thing you can do is provide, provide alt text, which you could simply say uh, org chart of affected environments divided into three categories, environmental, cultural, and project. Um, you know, that could be uh, somewhat accessible. It isn't the best user experience, but it's better than just saying org chart of effective environment, right? Um, the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to use a table to lay out your org chart. That doesn't work. People don't want to, when they're moving left and right, they're listening for, they're listening for associations with columns and rows. And when you use an org chart inside a table, it doesn't relate that same information. Tables are for data, not for org charts, right? The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to all alt text every single box in this. You don't want to create a bunch of little boxes with lines and then have to sit and write alt text for every one of them. That would be kind of ridiculous, right? So hopefully that gives you some ideas of how to handle an org chart. All right, let's move on to the one you've all been waiting for, layering content inside InDesign. All right, so let's take a look at this infographic here. You can see that we have a graphic. Now, above and beyond the color contrast issues going on with this text inside this blue background, we have, uh, it has some labels and some time, and it talks about estimated time of travel, and we've got this text down here, that, and this all happens to be just one big PNG, right? But we have this table. Let's zoom in here, right? Now, this text happens to be at nine point because we want this table super small so that we can use it in a layer underneath this infographic, right? So we've got a nice header and we've got some columns and rows and we have all the same information that was in our original graphic here. We can see it all there. So what do we do? Well, the easy thing to do is to simply take that table and put it behind, send it to back, and now it's hidden. But that's good when you have a document that only has one or two pages. What do you do when you've got a 50 page or 100 page or 200 page document and you wanna keep these two things together? You wanna keep them anchored in the flow of text both of them, right? Because on one hand, you have the visual graphic, the infographic that you've created. On the other hand, you've talked to your boss and he says, look, I don't want this table inside my document. I just want the infographic. And you're telling them, well, but look, it's got to be accessible. Here's the way you do it. This way that I'm about to show you gives you the way to have both items inside your document in the same text flow without you having to constantly chase that image around and make sure that the table stays with that image on that page. 
Let me show you how to do it. All right, let's look at this other example here. So this is a real world example. We have here this big infographic and you can see that it is one big giant JPEG and it's got a bunch of tables nested on top of it. And uh, this document happens to be 97 pages and a lot going on. So to simply lay these on top uh, when you've got lots of changes and text is flowing from one page to another, isn't really gonna be the way to go. So what I've done is I've combined all of these three tables into one table that has basically the same data, but in an accessible way. And so like I was talking to you about before, we're gonna use a custom anchor to be able to put both of these objects, basically one right on top of the other. So as this text flows, no matter how much text is added or taken away or which page it goes to, these two things stay exactly together. And here's how to do it. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move this graphic out of the way for a moment. And we're going to take our table and we're going to select the table and I use um, Control, Alt, and A to select that table, and I'm gonna cut it out of this separate box. Now I'm just gonna go underneath this figure and put it right where it's supposed to go. This is exactly where you'd wanna put the table if it were just the table, right? So how do we get this other graphic to be in line, threaded with everything else? Well, here's how you do it. We're going to delete that box, we're going to take this and we're gonna cut it and that's control X. And then we're gonna go up here in the same spot, which is basically right after, right before where the table was, and we're gonna hit paste. Now what happened? You can see that it pushed our table to the next page, which is not what we want at all. So we wanna get these two things underneath each other, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click here and I'm going to go to anchored object and I'm gonna to go to options. Now I'm gonna change this from inline or above to custom. And then I'm going to take it, and I always like to have mine top left corner. And then the next thing we wanna do is do keep with top and bottom column boundaries. We wanna uncheck that and hit okay. Now what happened? Let's take a look. Now we've got this and that right on top of each other. So the graphic is overlaid right on top of that image. So when we export this out to a PDF, it's going to read the alt text for this graphic first, and then it's going to read the table. So the graphic appears just before the table now in the read order. And so then we can do things with the alt text that we couldn't do before because they're getting the same information from the table that displays what's in the, uh, in the actual image, right? So now our alt text could definitely be something along the lines of graphic representation of a table below or table in the following figure or table 2.5 or whatever the label is. So this allows us to keep the document flow along with having two different items stacked on top of each other with an InDesign so that your document integrity stays together and you're able to provide both an assistive technology experience that's rich and informational and a visual experience that is clean and aesthetic. So let's talk about pattern fills and labels, especially when we're talking about pie charts and bar graphs. That's where you see them most often, but they can appear in just about any kind of infographic. The idea behind adding patterns, because color cannot be the only means of communicating information, the idea of a pattern is to allow us to further clarify the, the difference between one value and another. And so the same goes with labels. Sometimes there can be such a thing as too much accessibility. As you can see by this pie chart here, we've got a lot going on. We've got five different colors uh, and five different patterns. We've got some white separation. We've got some labels. They kind of threw everything and the kitchen sink at this one, right? Do we really need all of that? At some point, it becomes a cognitive disability where you have too much going on and it's hard to visually differentiate between one piece and another, right? Let's take a look at another example. Now this one is from a pie chart that I did a few years ago. The one on the left, you can see I've got some sideways text going on here and it's sort of accessible. I don't have any spacing in between my pie segments. My color contrast is good, 
but I don't really have a programmatic association between my legend and the pieces of pie. So I did an okay job, but not a great job. Now in the next year, I turned around and I really tried to focus on making this pie chart a little better. So I added some white separation in between the different values of the pie. I made sure that all of my text was horizontal, right? And then I added a programmatic association by adding the percentage of the value in the legend as well as the pie chart. So that made that association very clear as to which value belonged to which legend item. So that way I didn't really have to use a pattern fill. Now, had I not done that, I would have not been able to use uh, the same graphic. I would have had to introduce some kind of pattern fill to differentiate one color from another. Just remember, when it comes to pattern fills and line strokes like dots and dashes, there is a tipping point you can reach where you start to stray away from being accessible and you start moving toward cognitive barriers for people who have a hard time interpreting all the different patterns that you might be introducing in your infographic. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this session. I really do love accessibility. And as an accessibility advocate, I'm always looking for new ways to push the envelope of what it means to provide that equal experience for both those using assistive technology and those who are visually digesting the document. All right, guys, thank you so much for sticking with me through this session of A Future Date. Hopefully you've learned some tips and tricks that will push your designs further down the road of accessibility. If you've got some burning questions, stick around for the q and I'll be right here. If not, head on over to our Facebook group, PDF Accessibility, where we're always willing to answer any question you have about document accessibility. Again, my name's Dax Castro. Thank you for sticking with me.
Hello, everyone. We're glad you could join us today for our session on XR Access, uh, which is about virtual, augmented, and mixed reality for people with disabilities. Um, my name is Bill Curtis Davidson, and I'm one of our hosts for today's talk. Um, my role in XR Access is I um, am a leader of the guidelines and practices working group, which we'll learn about um, during this talk. I also am the accessibility leader at Magic Leap. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Dylan Fox. Hi, everyone. I'm Dylan Fox, uh, the Application Accessibility Group Leader for XR Access. Uh, and today I'm going to run you through what XR is and why accessibility for it matters. So what is XR? Uh, XR stands for Extended Reality. Uh, which is an umbrella term for a group of immersive technologies that mix the real and the digital worlds uh, to various degrees. Um, so virtual reality involves full immersion into a new virtual setting, uh, covering up the user's vision and putting them into a simulated reality. Um, we see on this slide uh, an example of this with someone wielding a sword immersed in a fantasy world and combat against a virtual foe. Augmented reality involves augmenting the world uh, with digital information. So here we see someone uh, looking at some manufacturing machinery through the camera of a tablet. Um, and on that tablet, they see additional digital information overlaid on the real image of the machinery. Uh, finally, mixed reality merges the physical and digital worlds, uh, bringing digital objects into physical spaces. So here we see a group of designers wearing Magic Leap headsets uh, and discussing a digital car model that floats in the air in front of them. Now, XR is already in use in a variety of different industries. Uh, on this slide, we see a collage of those uses. Um, we see VR for education with a boy wearing a headset reaching out to touch his studies. Uh, we see VR for entertainment, uh, with a man wielding uh, motion-tracked controllers against dinosaurs and aliens. Uh, we see AR for communication, uh, letting us see faraway colleagues as though they were in the same room. Uh, and AR for navigation, seeing Google Maps instructions uh, superimposed on the real world through a smartphone camera. Uh, and we just see all kinds of different 3D models and reviews. Um, we see a family looking at a hologram of a dinosaur skeleton in the museum. Uh, we see architects reviewing a house model. Um, we see doctors, both remote and on site, reviewing 3D brain maps. Um, so there's just a ton of ways that people are, are finding to use XR in uh, productive and entertaining ways. Um, now, as we look at all these, uh, consider a question. We'll have a couple of these throughout the deck. Uh, what XR applications are you already familiar with or using? Um, go ahead and type your answers in chat because we're there and we're looking forward to seeing them. Uh, now, the question that brings us here today is this. How can we ensure that the future of XR technology considers the needs of people with disabilities? Uh, we don't have all the answers on this already, but we know it will take both new and old techniques to make that happen. Um, First, XR accessibility is still going to have to utilize many of the tools and techniques uh, that have been developed for traditional technology systems. Uh, people have huge variation in their abilities. Uh, some people may have visual or cognitive mobility or hearing disabilities of various kinds. Um, they may have combinations of disabilities unique to them or other ones that don't cleanly fall into any of these categories. Um, now, we have decades worth of studies and practices that show us how to make applications accessible to people in all of these categories um, for a whole variety of, of existing technologies. Uh, and it's going to be important to take all of those into account when designing for XR. You know, very few of this just goes out the window. Uh, but in addition to that, um, XR offers some unique new challenges as well. Uh, for example, there are a lot of motion-tracked VR games uh, that expect their users to be able to jump and duck and dive and turn uh, to fight enemies or solve puzzles. Uh, but that doesn't work very well for, for example, people in wheelchairs. Uh, on this slide, we see someone in a wheelchair uh, using a tool called Walk-In VR to simulate motion controls so that he can enjoy the game without needing to be able to move his lower half. Uh, this kind of innovation is going to be necessary to define a new generation of inclusive design. 
Uh, and it's worth noting here that the curb cut effect is in full swing here. Um, techniques like this help not only people in wheelchairs, but also those who don't have a lot of space to play or a job that keeps them stationary. Uh, making applications more accessible benefits everyone. Uh, and in addition to that, um, there's some traditional techniques that actually need to be reinvented in the context of XR. Uh, for example, people who are deaf or hard of hearing or who have cognitive challenges uh, or who are language learners uh, have uh, long benefited from subtitles and captioning. Now in 2D, the captions can simply just go in the bottom of the screen. But in XR, there are all kinds of new spatial challenges with that. Because um, you can have situations where the source of the audio could be you know, behind you or somewhere out of your view. Um, maybe there isn't a bottom of the screen to place the captions on if you're in a full 360 world. Uh, and objects can come in between the user and the captions, um, which could potentially cause occlusion or motion sickness. Um, now, developers like Alchemy Labs have started to address these challenges. Uh, we see on this clip um, their game Vacation Simulator. Uh, we see the user holding a watering can and talking, talking to a gardening robot in a park. Um, the robot has captions that start next to it, but as the user moves uh, to the right to water some flowers, the captions remain visible, showing an icon of the gardening bot and an arrow pointing towards it, so that the user always knows who is talking, where they are, and what they're saying, even if they don't have hearing or a direct line of sight. Um, now, since hearing users would be able to hear the spatial audio, uh, hearing the voice of the bot from the left, this kind of captioning helps ensure that we have equivalent access for people with disabilities. Uh, another question to think about as we continue uh, is that these examples re represent just two of the challenges we'll need to consider. Uh, what other accessibility challenges and solutions uh, can you think of for XR applications? Go ahead and enter some in chat. Um, now, finally, it's worth noting that XR offers some unique possibilities for people with all kinds of disabilities. Um, we see on this slide all kinds of research that utilizes XR. Uh, going clockwise uh, from the top left, we see from Caltech uh, a mixed reality application with a view of real world objects surrounded by bright lines and labeled with their object names, uh, you know, laptop, chair, etc. Uh, this would enable people with visual impairments to locate objects at a range and help navigate. Uh, from NYU, we have a mobile AR app for sign language, uh, sign language to text and text to sign language transcription, uh, where a deaf signer and a hearing person are communicating, <coughs> excuse me, about making an appointment at a service counter. Uh, from Microsoft, we see a seeing VR tools that offer different ways to support low vision access to VR, uh, showcasing contrast lens, edge enhancements, peripheral remapping, recoloring, and more. Um, that could be applied not only to make VR apps more accessible, but to uh, objects in the real world as well. From Cornell Tech, uh, we see a low vision AR app on a head mounted display uh, that helps a woman focus on different objects while grayscaling the surrounding objects. Um, you know, this would help uh, people with visual impairments find specific things in a grocery store, for example. Uh, and finally, in the bottom left, we see from the Dan Marino Foundation and Magic Leap, uh, a VR simulation that employs digital humans to help young adults with autism uh, improve their social skills. So clearly there's many, many ways. We only touch the tip of the iceberg of the ways that XR can help people. Um, so another question to consider, how do we move from all of these great ideas and possibilities and research subjects towards actual implementation and wide scale impact? Uh, now that is what XR Access is here to do. So I'll pass it off to Bill to tell you about us. Thanks, Dylan. That was a great overview. And I think everyone can appreciate that this is really, um, we're in an exploratory phase where there's been a lot of great work done. Um, and really one of the reasons why XR Access exists now is to recognize all of the great work that's happening around the world in XR accessibility, whether that's VR, augmented reality or spatial computing mixed reality. And so um, we're really excited to uh, talk to you today about XR Access, uh, recognizing that. Um, and really the goal of XR Access is to advance XR accessibility by promoting inclusive design and these practices that are emerging in the industry and in all of the organizations that are part of our stakeholder groups. <clears throat> 
Uh, so what is XR Access? It's a community-driven effort. Uh, we're not um, a standards development organization, but we um, interact with them uh, as well as many other constituencies. Um, we're proud to say we have about 140 plus cross-sector participants. And really um, one of the um, intentional uh, ways that we're working is to be inclusive of all of the stakeholder groups in the community. Um, and that includes tech companies, um, such as the one I work for and many others who are interested in learning more about this and building better products to associations that are in the profession. Um, we've got the XR Association and others actively involve XR and learning, for example. Um, disability advocacy groups, as well as people with disabilities who are uh, thought leaders are involved in XR Access, as well as government, uh, education, researchers, and developers. Um, there's a lot of great organizations doing great things and we want to bring them all together. Um, this was launched last July um, through the leadership of Cornell Tech, uh, Dr. Shiri Azenkot, um, and uh, Larry Goldberg of Horizon Media uh, were both instrumental in bringing this um, effort to fruition. Um, and now we're in a phase where uh, once we launched last July, we formed research education and working groups. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today and invite you to participate. So how can how is everyone getting involved in XR Access? Um, and we invite you to as well. Uh, we have a technical working group stream that's happening uh, where uh, these include hardware devices, um, guidelines and practices, application accessibility, and content um, experiences. So we're bringing together a lot of thought leadership, um, pulling together a lot of resources, documenting user needs and use cases. Um, we'll be launching some surveys to help gather that information. Uh, we also have a lot of curating of uh, what exists out there uh, in a uh, body of knowledge. Um, so we're compiling a lot of information. Uh, we are coordinating with standards uh, organizations such as WC3, um, a very important organization, of course, that we have uh, members um, from that involved in uh, XR Access and we're sharing information with each other. And we're looking to define um, assistive tech features, testing techniques, practices for development. Um, again, this is a beginning stage of this uh, massive effort, which will likely uh, be a years long effort uh, to um, help ensure that ex uh, accessibility is a core topic in XR technology. Of course, aside from the technical work, um, something that's really important that we're involved in is educating and engaging. Uh, of course, this presentation is one example of that. Uh, we're presenting at different forums. Uh, we have uh, a blog posts and social media, blog posts from our website, social media, such as our LinkedIn group. Um, our partnerships and associations, we're trying to work through them to um, focus this um, topic in different associations as well, or industry associations. And then, of course, there's a lot of work going on with education and research in higher ed and other venues, um, corporate research um, functions, as well as um, public research done as part of um, cross-government, um, NGO, and um, higher ed. I really want to comment on how important it's been to have support from a very important organization, the Partnership for Employment and Accessible Technology, known as PEAT, um, who is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. We've been very lucky to have this organization um, help lead this, this community of practice, and they're really providing a lot of support. They're doing this as a part of their future of work efforts to help ensure that XR is born accessible. And really, this is key in helping harness the potential of XR to break down barriers to employment and workplace inclusion of people with disabilities. And I think all of us can appreciate 
um, especially during this um, pandemic crisis, that we all need to use technology to do our jobs, to be connected socially with each other, and to really collaborate and communicate with each other. It's very, very critical. And I think all of us are getting a, a very um, important lesson with that, with this crisis, of course, and there's a lot being said about that. Um, but some examples of accessible XR technology that are really key to the future of work and inclusion of people with disabilities are to make sure that virtual online learning and collaboration practice, practice platforms, excuse me, support remote workers and that we can have multimodal communication tools, whether those are embedded in head mounted display type devices such as VR or um, uh, mixed reality spatial computing devices or on um, augmented reality, uh, flat screen type implementations, uh, regardless um, having ways to communicate fluidly and in multi-mode is very important. And then one key area of uptake in XR is indeed in training and education, whether that's training um, the next generation of leaders or if it's training people who are working in a workplace, like such as on a factory who might be getting spatialized um, remote assistance or training um, in the context of the work that they're doing, it's very important that we continue making sure that XR is accessible for all of these type of use cases, but there are many more as well to consider. <clears throat> I want to recognize some key collaborators. I mentioned 140 plus, uh, but some of the um, important um, efforts that um, and organizations that are supporting us, of course, Cornell Tech, Verizon Media, Pete, US Department of Labor, and WC3 I've mentioned. Um, and just to um, name uh, some others, Able Gamers, BBC Research and Development, Immersive Accessibility Project, which is out of the EU and is a very, very important effort, um, netting a lot of great um, research and practice um, practices in immersive media that are highly valuable. Open Inclusion, VR First, and XR and Learning. Again, there are numerous others that um, are involved and we're excited to engage even more organizations. Uh, for WC3, I do want to mention there are some really important efforts underway. There's a editor's draft of XR Accessibility User Requirements, abbreviated XAUR, that you can find online that um, the WC3 is welcoming input on and review of. So we encourage you to do that, to look at that. And also there's an immersive web working group as well as an immersive captions community group. And these efforts are really um, helping kind of develop um, the user requirements, but also looking ahead to the spatial web and uh, spatial applications that will utilize open standards. So we really want to encourage you to learn more about that and become engaged uh, with those efforts if you see fit. Finally, um, I'll just wrap up. Um, Dylan actually posed some questions earlier. Um, and we've been looking at any questions that are posed during uh, the course of our session today. But I'll leave a couple other ones here. And as time permits, we'll answer these questions during this session. And certainly, we ask that you reach out as well after the session uh, if you'd like to dialogue with us more. So some of the things we'd like to hear more about from you is what access, XR accessibility challenges have you observed? <clears throat> and what are some barriers to overcoming those challenges? We'd love to hear your stories. And we'd also like to know, um, based on what organizations you work with, um, maybe you've explored or considered using or are already using XR technology, we'd love to hear about your experience and hear about your ideas about accessibility that may be specific to your industry or organization. So please um, engage us in those ways as well. And I'll just wrap up uh, today's session by providing a list of links. Our website is xraccess.org, 
You can reach us by email at info at xraccess.org. On Twitter, we're at xraccess, and you can also locate hashtag xraccess. Um, I'm on Twitter at B. Curtis Davidson, and Dylan is on Twitter at Usability Fox. And for those of you interested in another online event, our most significant next event is going to be our annual symposium. It's the second year. Um, last year was our founding symposium. This year we're going to have a symposium with broader participation. We'll be all virtual July 20th and 21st, 2020. And you can find out more and uh, apply to attend online at www xraccess.org slash symposium. And with that, we'll say thank you. Um, Dylan, thank you for being my co-host today. Um, we're both delighted to um, speak to you about this important effort and hope that you uh, learn more and engage with us. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll look forward to speaking with you more in the comments.
Hi, we're from the Yahoo Finance Android team. Uh, I'm Sukriti Chadha. Uh, I'm a product manager on uh, the Android side and also on some horizontal projects. And I have Yatin Kaushal, who is the lead engineer on this project. Uh, we also have Kasaya Timmons, uh, who uh, helped us with this project from the accessibility team at Verizon Media. Uh, so a little bit of context on the audio charts project. Um, it started off with a, an, an informal conversation between uh, me and, uh, and a mobile architect uh, who worked horizontally across the different mobile apps uh, uh, at Yahoo. And the conversation was about accessibility on mobile in general, but more specifically on the finance use case where, as you see on the right, there's hundreds of data points presented at any given time in this case, it's a three-month ch uh, chart for Verizon um, and for a visually limited user or, or, or a visually impaired user, it's uh, incredibly hard to get that kind of information that a sighted user has access to just by the fact of representing so many data points um, in, in the form of a graph. The status quo or, or standard, standard practice for showing this kind of information um, uh, to a talkback or a screen reader user is um, reading it in, in the form of a table where uh, when we did our user studies, the patterns or, or the overall um, uh, movement of the data over time was lost after uh, just five or eight data points for a lot of users. Uh, and to consider hundreds of data points being relayed that way was uh, accessible in the sense that they still had access to it, but it's not truly usable, especially in the context of financial markets where time is of the essence. And, and that's what led to the inception of this project, which is to use uh, music uh, in terms of pitch and some other uh, uh, music qualities and haptics to convey the same information in a much more time efficient way. We have now also open sourced this project uh, thanks to Yatin's hard work, uh, which is now available to the overall Android community. And uh, any app that has a line graph implementation can very easily port uh, our solution over and, and make their apps not just accessible, but truly usable for all of their users. The links to the GitHub page um, and the blog post that talks a little bit more about the context and the implementation is linked here. I'd also play uh, how, the how the finance accessible charts work, um, just to give some context as to what the implementation and application looks like when it comes to life. Easy. Three months chart, double tap to explore. Double tap to activate. Easy three months chart trending up. Current price 59.75, previous close 57.63, high 59.96, low 55.59. Swipe or drag two fingers across the chart to explore. Double tap to activate. The 2nd of September 2019, 59.06, in list 15 items. August 26, 2019, 58.16. August 19, 2019, 55.92. The 12th of August 2019, 56.65. BZ three months chart. Settings. Navigate up button. Double tap to act. Settings. Double tap to activate. Controls. Links. Headings. 12 a.m. 57.7. 12 a.m. 55.59. Heading. 12 a.m. 55.78. Heading. 12 a.m. 59.96. Heading. Navigate up button. So that just uh, gives a summary of how uh, the solution overall works. There's some nuances in the uh, experience overall that I'll touch on in the next slide, uh, which covers the product and design considerations that went into making this uh, uh, interface come to life. In terms of how uh, the solution is architected, it's converting the digital information, which is the numbers on the y-axis in this case, and scaling that to um, human audible range of frequencies and a pleasant range of frequencies that uh, we can hear. And after we do that, the pitch then maps onto the numbers um, on the, on the y-axis of the chart. And as the user scrolls back and forth between one edge of the screen to the, to the other, 
um, the tones are played. And if there's a point of interest to the user, they can decide to stop there and scroll back and forth for individual data points. And that seamless transition between uh, the frequency uh, and the actual data point being read back to them is what makes this solution novel and, and exciting for, for the users. Uh, the reason we chose to do a full screen uh, experience is that it's easier for users uh, that don't have a, 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 a complete 100% vision, is that recognizing the two ends of the device is much easier than trying to navigate a complex thing like a chart within the context of a larger screen where there's a lot more elements competing for focus. The audio feedback is uh, the data point which in this case is, for example, August 20, uh, 2019 um, uh, stock price X, Y, and Z. And, and, and that's the format that is the default. Uh, in the settings page, the users can pick other formats which are less or more verbose, uh, depending on what they prefer. Because the uh, most important lesson we learned from doing user studies and then uh, launching this at scale was that every user has their own nuanced expectations of what the experience should look like and what they need from uh, from a chart, uh, especially in the finance context. And we've made it as customizable as possible. There's also a haptics element to it, which is not apparent uh, in the PowerPoint. But when you stop at a point of interest or, or, or a high or low or start date, start price or an end price in, in the stock case, for example, there's also haptic feedback that you get while you're scrolling back and forth to inform the user that it's a point of interest and something they might want to explore further. Here's a, a, a drawing of, of user studies that we did with uh, eight users. There's a few graphs here of the users that were following um, data patterns that are shown in the in the graph that's pink on the right, uh, the left hand uh, bottom left corner. I'm sorry, uh, and what a set of users drew after listening to the the pitch. And as you can see, a lot of people were able to get the overall pattern from the chart. And that's what we were hoping for. It was not to convey the actual numbers, but the overall problem that we were trying to tackle was uh, that people should be able to get the overall pattern or, or the trend of the data that they were looking at from this uh, music and haptics combination. And uh, many of the users that we tested with were able to draw this upward trending sort of graph with a little bit of a low. Uh, with one exception. So it, it seemed very promising from the very beginning. And as we customized the solution uh, further, the results became a lot better. Uh, now to the engineering part, where Yathan can talk about what went into actually building this. So from the engineering perspective, we started with rendering the chart itself. Uh, we used Android's native library, Canvas, to render the chart, um, as well as draw any uh, axes and labels uh, on it. Once the chart was rendered, we then placed a recycler view above the whole chart, which would then render the data points. These data points are represented as invisible columns. And when TalkBack is enabled, uh, the user can focus on one of these invisible columns and hear TalkBack read out loud the time and price of that data point. In the settings page, you can change the format um, in which TalkBack reads aloud that data point. Um, with TalkBack enabled, the user can also swipe from one point to the next. The user can also press and hold two fingers, which will then engage the tone generator. In this mode, you can scrub both your fingers across the chart and hear a tone whose pitch will correspond with its placement on the trend line. The higher the point, the higher the pitch of the tone. The pitch range can also be modified in the settings. Here's the high level Here's the high level architecture diagram uh, showing how an app could expect to use the open sourced Songbird library. The app would use the Songbird chart view on whatever page it would like to show the chart. It would then provide a view model, which will have information like the data points and any labels. And it can also ask the chart view to play the summary audio. This will loop through all the data points and play each of their tones giving the user a sense of the overall trend of this chart. Once the app is done using this chart view and wants to clear up its resources, it can call its dispose method. Um, and internally, the chart view uses um, an audio helper, 
uh, which will be notified whenever a scrubbing event or a release event has happened and then play the tone accordingly. Over half of our talkback enabled user base is interacting with audio charts. Um, and some of the next steps that we would, we would like to take are to improve the tone sound, um, allow for more customizability of that chart view itself, as well as support any feature requests that come in on our GitHub repository page. In terms of some of the other applications uh, of audio charts or, or just the um, audio translation of digital information, we see uh, applications across voice assistants like Alexa or Google Home. Um, some applications also on desktop where it's not as interactive, but it's um, as important to make those interfaces and, and charts and uh, digital uh, information that's uh, primarily visual accessible uh, through haptics and music. The third and more important one would be educational, where, um, uh, for example, Kasaya talks about her experience with uh, getting an MBA and using books that had graphs and charts all over the place and, and not an easy way to access them. So we could easily envision a, a QR code, for example, and, and that deep linking into an Android app that translates the, this information to users who would like to then quickly see the trend uh, of a given chart. Uh, and we'd like the uh, mobile community to take this on with the initial um, uh, sort of prototype or, or uh, implementation of the project that, that we have put um, as an open source project. Uh, one of the uh, feedbacks that we got from our users uh, on the App Store uh, is mentioned above, which was really heartening to see. Um, and this is a user who used to be a, a Forex trader and never thought they had uh, a chance at doing that again. And, and because of the solution, they now believe they can. And that's what makes um, uh, putting all this effort and into making something like this possible and uh, being at a company that supports and uh, appreciates the work that we do towards accessibility. So, so that's been great. Um, we'd love to hear uh, questions, comments that, that you, you all have. And thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for day one of a future date. Thank you for coming. Please stick around for a live Q&A in the YouTube chat. Or if you'd like to just come back tomorrow, we will be here at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That is 8 a.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. British time, and 5 p.m. Central European time. We'll see you tomorrow.